I took my super skeptic boyfriend on our first camping trip up to the Mount Adams area because I'd heard of some spooky UFO action in the area. We hadn't been dating that long. We saw some UFO action that defied his skeptic explanations in a dispersed spot, but nothing I hadn't seen before. Lights appearing out of nowhere, zipping along and then disappearing, lights appearing and joining up and then disappearing, stuff like that. It was pretty satisfying to hear him say, yeah, I have no idea what that was. A few months later, we were camping with his dad and stepson, who were both longtime veterans in the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. We mentioned the spots where we had camped, and his stepdad, who is not a believer of anything like this, said that the area we'd been in had been his beat for years. Without any prompting from us, he said, we were supposed to be up there looking for camp thieves. We never caught any thieves, but we saw a lot of weird stuff in the sky. When I pressed him for details, he got a little cagey, but he did tell a really creepy story about how these big black logging trucks with no lights would appear and steal lumber in the middle of the night. So he and his partner staked out one night to catch them. They were backed into the bush and had to sit in complete silence to let the truck cool down so nobody could detect them with heat or night vision goggles. The back of the truck was deep in the bush, meaning that only the forest was behind them. Then, after over an hour of sitting in silence, these huge bright lights appeared behind them, from deep within the forest. They were so bright he could see the entire outline of the truck, the antenna, the spotlights, and their silhouettes in the shadow. This was the early 80s, so we're not talking LED lights here. He said that he'd never seen anything like it. Then the lights went out, and everything was silent. No truck noise, no rustling in the forest behind them, nothing. I love the guy, but he has the imagination and personality of a potato. So there's no way he made this up. That's why it was so creepy and believable to me. He had a few other stories, too, that I'd love to get more information on. I, for one, believe him. When I, was, when I was around five, I went camping with my parents in a place called Bear Creek Reservoir in BC. It's a very isolated place, deep in the woods. We got there by driving up an old logging road. The actual reservoir itself was very beautiful and quiet. I actually looked up the area on Google Maps and it still gives me chills, even looking at it from a satellite perspective. But anyway. The day passed by without incident, and we mostly just swam the whole day. We went to bed that night, and nothing unusual had happened. But the following morning, I woke up in my parents' tent just as the sun was making its appearance. I unzipped the tent and noticed a figure standing maybe 50 feet away. The light was still fairly dim, so it was hard to make out distinct details. But it was just standing there, staring at me, unmoving. The entity had the figure of a woman of average size, but instead of seeing a face, there was just darkness. Even so, I could tell that it was looking at me. And instead of clothes and skin, it had leaves and sticks, as if it was made from them. I remember feeling very afraid of this creature, like if I left the tent, I wouldn't be seen again kind of fear. So I tried waking up my parents, and they were both really pissed that I woke them up and they didn't believe me at all, until they finally got up later and explored the area. We ended up finding a bunch of man-made structures made of branches and other weird stuff in the area, but not one where I had seen it, so I don't know. Anyway, that's my true story. Let me know what you think. I'd like to go there again someday and see if I can find anything, but maybe it's best I don't. A 
couple of years ago, my brother bought a large piece of land out in the middle of nowhere, about 30 miles or so from cell phone reception. It's quiet. There's no light pollution, no paved roads, and not a lot of people around. Shortly after he bought the place, two of my brothers, the landowner and another, myself and our families, spent a weekend camping on the land and doing our best to clean it up. People had used it as a dump. There were many downed trees and stuff like that. On the second night that we camped there, I woke up in the middle of the night to relieve myself. As I was walking to the bushes in the dark, I realized that I could faintly hear music. This didn't really strike me as odd because I knew my brother had a radio in his camper. I finished up and went back to sleep with no further thought on the matter. The next morning at breakfast, I mentioned the radio and the music. Several other people recalled waking in the night and hearing music. But here's the kicker. No two people heard the same music. Finally, the brother who had brought the radio woke up. I asked him about the music and he seemed a bit freaked out. He said that he woke up sometime during the night and went outside to smoke. He had heard music as well and had assumed that it was someone else. I should mention though, that he was the only one with a generator and a radio. If it wasn't his radio we heard, it wasn't anyone else's either. I've been back several times, but I'm a bit freaked out by that place at night. I have fun while I'm there, but I'm almost always armed and I don't sleep in a tent anymore. I sleep in my SUV with the doors locked. It might seem kind of dumb, but realizing that everybody heard different music when there were no people, no functional radios that were on, and no electricity is quite creepy. This happened at a school camp when I was about 11 years old. Our school camp was scheduled to be at a campground about two and a half to three hours away. I remember talking to people about the camp and where I was going, and one of my friends who was a year older told me that they saw something like a pair of eyes when they were down at the creek one night. Skip ahead, I can't exactly remember what night this was of the five day camp, but I remember exactly what happened and I always will. We were sitting with the other students and we had just finished eating, meaning it was time to play games and to calm all the kids down. My friend Savannah told me that she needed to go down to our tent and change clothes and asked if I would come with her. I said that I would and one of the teachers said that I could go with her. Keep in mind the tents were way away from the rest of camp and it was actually a walk to get to them as it was a huge campground. So we got a torch and walked down to the tents. We got in and left our tent window open for light as it would have been awkward to have the torch on. Stupid, I know, but we were young. We turned around and I started changing too. Then something very bright caught my attention. I looked at the window and there were flashing bright lights everywhere and I swear there was no way it could have been a camera because there were tons at the window moving so fast. I quickly spun around and in like one second, they were at the door, then vanished. I quickly said to my friend, what was that? And we totally freaked out. We quickly finished getting changed and hurried back to our class and teachers where the teacher had just talked to the class we had to explain what happened to the teachers. It seems like just a sicko taking photos when you hear the story, but I promise that I know it wasn't a camera. You can take my word for that. There was no way, and I've been around cameras modeling and stuff, so I know what all the camera flashes are like. I don't know what I saw that night, and I don't think I ever will, but I know that I will remember that night for the rest of my life. I 
I was out walking the woods at an ungodly hour of the morning. I believe it was around one to two in the morning. Last year, I was working at a church youth camp in Wisconsin. The camp was on two sides of a highway and a tunnel under the highway connected the two sides of the camp so that the campers could more readily access the other side. My then girlfriend and our friend liked to walk the woods at night after we were done with work. The first time we had done this, we were scared shitless by a fox barking. The deer in the woods were fairly docile and didn't spook easily. We soon learned to identify the sound of the fox and we saw it several times. One night, it was just me and my ex-girlfriend walking through the woods. As we rounded a corner in the trail, I noticed movement in the field by the tunnel, gray shapes. I assumed they were deer and I pointed them out to my girlfriend. We continued our walk past the tunnel. Just as we passed the entrance to the tunnel, maybe about 20 yards, we heard the most horrendous screeching. It sounded as if somebody was being strangled. It did not sound at all like the fox, but we shrugged it off. We continued up the road. All of a sudden, I had this weird feeling, and I turned around to see a tall figure standing in the road. It was dressed in white, and it was all hazy. I wondered if I was a little too tired and was seeing things, so I poked my girlfriend and asked her to take a look behind us. She immediately noticed it too. Something we both noted was that our eyes kept sliding off the figure. It was like we couldn't keep our vision centered on it. I was thinking this and she voiced it without me saying anything to her. I pulled my hunting knife from its sheath, but I somehow knew that it wouldn't do anything. Without looking away from the thing, I said, let's go, now. We backed away and then started running and we didn't stop until we were back to the cabins. When I got back inside the cabin, the guy in the bunk next to me was still up texting his girlfriend. I quickly told him what I had seen. He looked at me and said, that's why I don't go out at night. I never went back out into those woods at night again. And when I talk about this, I still get chills and a nervous feeling. We had no drugs or alcohol. We were both under 21 and we were working at a church camp with strict policies. So I have no idea what we saw. I grew up in Saugus, California, on Copper Hill. I've had several paranormal experiences while living there. I've had things thrown at me. I've seen full-body apparitions. I had a milk carton crushed in front of me and had an unplugged vacuum cleaner turn on. My parents, whom I live with, had their own experiences as well, such as seeing an entity or just having a general unease in the house. I guess I'm just reaching out to those who may know the area because this stupid house haunts my dreams to this day, and it's been 18 years since I lived there. I told a story before here, expressing my concerns for a house that I lived in 18 years ago. I wanted validation that maybe the area itself was haunted, and I wasn't the only one being tormented. Turns out a lot more people responded than I initially thought would. Some wanted a more detailed account of the happenings within the abode, so here we go. Let me start off by stating that there were numerous occurrences, so many that I'm only going to share the big ones. Some smaller events were hearing my mother's voice when she wasn't home, general unease throughout the entirety of the house, and my younger brother's room seeming to be in a permafrost even when it was over a hundred outside. His electronic toys would go off on their own as well. I would hear, I am the Dark Knight, in the middle of the night on some occasions, from his talking Batman toy. That part was kind of hilarious looking back on it now. Just for quick info, I was between the ages of 6 and 12 when I experienced all this madness, and I am now 30. The first occasion I want to talk about is a shadow that I encountered. It was probably around 7 in the morning. I was eating breakfast at the dining table before school. 
I had made myself a bowl of cereal and left the milk out on the counter of our kitchen. From the dining table, I had a clear view of our entire kitchen. As I was eating, I started to feel that nasty unease that I so often felt. I looked up from my bowl and into the kitchen, and I stared in horror as I saw a black mist enter the kitchen and move toward the counter where the milk carton was. As the mist started to dissipate, the milk carton on the counter was crushed, the cap flying off and what remained of the milk exploding everywhere. My father, who was a very abusive and angry man, walked into the kitchen and started screaming at me for making the mess. I just stared at the table. I didn't even try to defend myself. What was I supposed to say? A shadow crushed it? The second experience I'll elaborate on is being tormented in my room. There was one night in particular where I stayed up late, as I often did. I was a fearful child. I was staring at my bedroom door. I could sense that unease, and I tried my best to make myself comfortable. As I continued to stare at the door, I felt my blankets tug toward the lower corner of my bed. As I sat up in terror, the corner of my comforter lifted and started shaking violently, as if my blankets were going to be ripped off. I was so mortified that I went to scream, but nothing came out. I've never experienced that before or after. It brings even more fear because you can't call out for anyone in that state. Finally, I did manage to yell for my parents with a raspy voice. They came into my room as the shaking stopped and searched it to make sure that there weren't any intruders or that our cat wasn't scaring me. They found nothing. On other occasions, I've had my rocks from my rock tumbler thrown at me as I ran out of my room. And I've seen small shadows darting in and out of mine and my brother's rooms. The last incident that I'll mention was probably one of the last experiences that I had before moving. I was about 12, and I had just gotten home from school. I was a latchkey kid. I went straight for my back living room. I had two living areas, as a lot of houses in the area had at the time. Maybe they still do. I don't know. I plopped down on the couch and turned on my television. There was a vacuum sitting next to the TV. My puppy joined me. Suddenly I got that weird feeling again. I tried my best to ignore it, but my puppy started whimpering and ran to the back door that led to the backyard. I called to her, desperately trying to deny that anything was going to happen. She progressively got louder in her cries and started scratching at the back door, something that she had never done. I stood up to go get her, and as I did, I saw a mist form next to the vacuum. I thought maybe it was just dust, puffing up from the bag, and I walked toward it to investigate. As I got closer, the vacuum suddenly turned on, startling me. It turned off within a few seconds, and I thought, maybe it was a power surge. I investigated further, only to discover that the cord wasn't even plugged in. Needless to say, I grabbed my puppy and stayed at my neighbor's house until my parents got home from work. I don't know if anybody who lives in Saugus can tell me what happened. I don't know if the land is haunted or if it was just the house. Either way, it haunts me. To this very day. My husband and I live in Willow Creek, California, in Northern California. Our small town revolves around Bigfoot. Everything here is Bigfoot themed. We even have a cage in case he's ever captured. No joke. Our property is 40 acres and is surrounded by forest service land. We have no neighbors. We've always felt like we've been watched. We barely hear any wildlife and rarely see any, despite living in the woods. A couple of separate nights we've had knocking on our bedroom wall and window, and it's freaked us out a bit, but we've since brushed it off. Tonight, though, 
My husband had to take our quad up to the generator above our house to fill our solar panels with water. It was pitch black, and as soon as he turns out the quad and it turns off, he's loudly screamed at by what he described as a large male human. He did what he had to do and quickly left. He's convinced that whatever it was was not human, as it's extremely unlikely that we have someone else living in our woods. I'm trying to chalk it up as an animal, but it's getting hard to. Does this sound like Bigfoot behavior or something else? About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington State. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before, and so has my husband, but we've never stayed there before. To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or yelling or something. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals, and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. So here we are at this campground. The first night, everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day, we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also must say, while I have read a lot about sleep paralysis, I have never experienced it until this night, and I have not since. Once we were all in bed, I started to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me in kind of what felt like a blur, but I'm unable to shout or scream or move. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot tall or so demon-like thing. It has horns and it's difficult to make out its face and it's terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming. Are you okay? I told him I was fine and tried to go back to sleep. But the same thing happened again, except this time the demon was closer to me. I remember shouting in my head, Jesus is my savior, go away, but he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm and wakes me up, saying I'm still screaming. At this point, I still told him I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more, and the same thing happened again and again, and every time, the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, he wouldn't leave, and again, my husband would wake me up. Eventually, I told him what was going on. He said he was sorry. This time, I didn't try to fall back asleep. I wrapped as much of him as I could around me and desperately tried not to sleep. I felt like something was trying to pull me towards sleep, but I fought it. Next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I have never researched the area. I can't remember the name of the campground. Because I was so terrified, I haven't really shared this story until recently. One night, in the spur of the moment, my best friend, my girlfriend, and I went camping on the banks of a creek that I lived within five miles of. We grabbed a 20-pack of beer, some blankets, and some cigarettes, and headed out in my piece-of-shit van with good spirits. It was about a week to ten days before Halloween, so it got dark on us pretty quickly. We made haste and gathered firewood with flashlights, ignited a fire, which rapidly grew hot, and threw off a lot of light, which allowed us to gather enough wood to chill and drink a couple of beers. 
We broke out the boom box and commenced having a good time. A few hours went by very quickly, and my girlfriend went to the van to sleep, although I don't know how, as it was pretty cold away from the fire. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend got off work at midnight and brought us more beer, though we didn't need it, as we had only drank about half of what we had initially brought. Those two got in an argument and she left. We watched as her taillights faded into the night. Then the weird stuff started happening. This place wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was secluded, but we could see farmhouses from where we were. It was far enough tucked out and cold enough where nobody would be screwing around anywhere near us. All of a sudden, my buddy goes, screw that woman, and turns up the radio as loud as it would go, but not for long. It was about that time that I heard what he was talking about. A distinct woman's voice from across the creek scream in a guttural way, help me. I looked across the fire at my buddy to see him look as pale and sheepish as I felt. He turned down the radio before I could say anything. Dude, did you hear that? He said. He grabbed his cell phone and we both grabbed flashlights and shined them across the creek. He called his girlfriend to make sure she didn't have car trouble down the road. She was already home. That was like a relief and more stress at the same time. It wasn't her, so who the hell could it be? We stood there in the grip of fear. Lights shined across the water. We didn't hear anything for what seemed like forever. Just when we were about to chalk it up to imagination or jitters or something, we hear, help me. A woman that couldn't have been a hundred yards away from where we were standing, which was right on the opposite bank of the creek from where we were. We quickly shone our lights to where the plea for help was coming from, but there was nothing there. We both called out, hello, where are you? Hello? No response ever came. Being experienced in the outdoors, we both knew that if she was being attacked or chased, there would be other noises we could hear, like rustling in the fallen leaves, or as close as it sounded, some more cries for help or twigs snapping or something. By this time, whatever buzz we had from the beer was long gone. We began gathering whatever we could grab and I woke up my girlfriend and commanded her to start the van and that we were leaving. She promptly did this and it's probably a good thing that she did because what came next still scares me to this day and is completely unexplainable. As we were piling in, we hear, help me, come from the very back of the van, which was in the complete opposite direction of where the screams had been coming from. Needless to say, we left the beer and radio and got out of Dodge. I had my girlfriend get out of the way and I burned out, nearly wrecking the car in the process. I drove the dirt road about 60 all the way out. This happened in October of 2002 and I can't reconcile what it was. I tried saying that it was maybe coyotes or foxes. They make a yipping bark and a really scary scream respectively. There aren't any mountain lions within 500 miles of this place, so it wasn't that either. But whatever it was spoke, and to my knowledge, none of those things do. Whatever it was, it scared two 21-year-olds into leaving a case of beer behind. Honestly, I don't think I want to know what it was. Although, I think I have a pretty good idea. Something happened when I was camping 20 years ago, and I can't get it out of my head. If you have any ideas about what this might be, I'm very interested in hearing it. I was visiting my uncle and cousin, Sarah, in rural Pennsylvania. I was about 16, and Sarah was about 12. Sarah asked me if we could go camping, which meant pitching a tent at the top of this huge foothill that was on the property. The foothill was very steep and had woods at the top. I'd never been camping before then, but I figured if anything happened, we could just walk back down to the house. So I said, cool, no problem. We pitched the tent so the woods were directly behind it, with the tent opening facing out toward the scenery and the view. 
We roasted marshmallows, told campfire stories, and got in the tent around 11 p.m. or midnight. Sarah fell asleep right away, but I couldn't, so I was just lying there counting sheep. Suddenly, I heard leaves shuffling in the woods behind the tent, and I heard footsteps coming out of the woods behind the tent. There were a few steps, and then it would stop. Then a few more, and as it got closer, I heard it step on some large rocks. It sounded like a really large hoof stepped on the rock, because it made that same clop sound as a horse. As it got closer to the tent, I could feel the impact of each step in the ground under me, so whatever it was sounded very heavy. At first I thought it was a large buck, and I debated waking up my cousin so she wouldn't miss it. But then it kept coming closer to the tent, closer than a deer or buck ever would have. And suddenly I was overcome with this feeling of full body dread, like something was very, very wrong. Then I heard a really bizarre sound. It sounded like it was coming from about eight to 10 feet off the ground. And the best way I can describe it is like someone had a huge roll of masking tape and was pulling off a big section at a time. It was this odd tearing sound for lack of a better word. And each tearing sound was loud and lasted two to three seconds. I told myself that it was a deer and that it was tearing bark off trees and that's what was making the noise, but deep down I knew something was wrong. I didn't want to risk waking or scaring Sarah, so I just lay there as quietly as possible, praying that whatever it was would leave. But instead of leaving, the tearing sound got closer still about eight to 10 feet off the ground. Now it was directly behind the tent, within five to 10 feet. Right then I heard Sarah scream whisper my name and I realized she was awake and heard it too. She asked me what it was and I told her that it was fine, that it was just a deer and to go back to sleep. She said, that doesn't sound like a deer but I insisted that it was because I was too scared to make a run for the house with whatever this thing was right outside. So we listened to it slowly move around to the left side of the tent, still close, still making the sound every few seconds. And then things got even weirder. It started moving around to the front of the tent where the ground dropped off steeply. So each few feet forward was also several feet down. As this thing went around to the front, the sound stayed at the eight to 10 foot height and was slowly moving to the right. Now, if the thing making this sound was standing on the ground, then the sound should have dropped several feet, but the sound stayed at the same height all the way around. I even wondered if it was a bird, but it was moving too slowly and that wouldn't account for the hoof steps I'd heard before. After the sound faded into the woods, Sarah and I just lay awake for the rest of the night, too afraid to leave the tent. At first light, we booked it back to the house and told my uncle what had happened. Even though he didn't know what it was, he just shrugged and didn't seem too concerned. But that experience scared me so much I've never been camping since, since I know I didn't hallucinate or imagine it because Sarah heard it too. Has anyone else ever heard of anything like this? I've asked friends who are avid outdoorsmen, hunters, and trackers, and none of them have ever heard of anything like it. At the time that this happened, I didn't really know what was going on. I just had the impression that the woods outside of my house were very creepy. I only recently decided that I think it was a Bigfoot after doing a lot of research and seeing a lot of similarities between my own story and other people's stories who have had encounters. My family started building a house in rural South Georgia when I was 12 and we moved in once it was finished a few months after I turned 13. It was a few miles outside of the town we lived in, a plantation town on the Florida-Georgia border. 
We lived there until I graduated from high school in 2013. The first thing I don't actually remember happening, but my dad told me about it a few months ago. Apparently the first night my family slept in the new house, when none of the windows had curtains or blinds yet, I came into my parents' bedroom and asked to sleep with them. I did this a lot as a little kid, but it was pretty unusual by the time I was 13. My dad said that I told him I saw a face looking into my window and that it scared me. The rest of all of this I remember pretty clearly. One time, my sister and I were jumping on a trampoline in our backyard, and all of a sudden we heard something whistle at us. It came from the side of the house, near our garage. I can't explain exactly why it was so terrifying, but it scared us to death. We jumped off the trampoline and sprinted inside, slamming the door behind us. It was just so weird, because we had already met the neighbors at that point, and we didn't have many and it didn't make sense that they would hide from us and whistle. They would have just walked up to us. Plus, we hadn't seen any people approaching. My sister has told me that she saw something hiding behind the trash can next to the house, but I didn't see that. She doesn't remember the whistling part, but I swear I'll never forget it. It was just so bizarre. I think that she might have seen something and remembered what she saw, while I only remembered what I heard. Sometimes I think that I remember seeing a dog or something run to the side of the house from the woods, like, super fast. But I don't know for sure if that actually happened. Anyway, that was one of the single freakiest things that has ever happened to me. I know it sounds mundane, but in the moment, it was bone-chilling, and I still get chills thinking about it. Anyway, after that, my dad decided to build a privacy fence around our backyard and we got two dogs a little bit after that. The yard was pretty big, and my sister and I were both pretty athletic. We would put on headphones and play in the yard while we listened to music, kick a soccer ball, run laps around the yard, play fetch with the dogs, things like that. Sometimes we did this with each other, and sometimes by ourselves. At night, I always thought I would see some sort of cone-shaped head looking at me over the fence. But if I did a double take to make sure that I wasn't seeing things, the head would be gone. Other times I'd be out in the yard by myself, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I would feel like I was being watched. This was always scarier to me than when I thought I saw things. I swear it was like I knew that something was watching me, and it was overwhelming. I would stop what I was doing immediately, and go inside. This happened all the time. Other times, I'd be shooting basketball in our driveway, or going for a jog through the neighborhood. It was a developing subdivision, not a house out in the woods by itself, and I would get that same freaky feeling. After we got our licenses, I think I actually saw one while I was driving. We were with another friend who also lived outside the city limits, on the way to her house. Our friend was in the front seat, and my sister was in the back seat. We were coming around this bend not too far away from our neighborhood, and all of a sudden my friend and I saw this super tall brown thing on the side of the road. It was very tall, ancient. It looked like a really old man with a long beard and a distorted face. It was slender too, not bulky. My friend and I saw it at the same time, and both said, what was that? I guess my sister was on her phone or something, because I remember that she asked us what we saw, but we'd already passed it by the time she looked out her window. My friend and I both agreed that it was a man in a mask trying to scare people, but I don't think either of us believed that. From then on out, every time I drove past that spot, I would try to see if there were any weird trees or something that we maybe could have thought was a person with a mask, but it just looked like a regular patch of woods. Another time, a different friend was playing with us outside as the sun was setting. We were walking down this empty road that no houses had been built on yet, and to our left was some woods with miles and miles of ATV trails. All of a sudden, he just goes, run. We didn't ask questions. 
We all sprinted back to the house. When we got back, he was shaken up, and he said that he saw something, but he never did tell us what it was. My sister and I are both grown now, and our parents sold the house and moved out of state when we were in college, so we haven't been back for years. But after I did some research and started putting some pieces together, I asked my sister if she thought the house we grew up in was creepy, and she said it absolutely was. She would feel like she was being watched in the yard too, and remembers seeing shadows moving in the woods. She said she'll never forget seeing something hiding behind the trash can that one time. She even independently googled Bigfoot sightings in the town we grew up in, and found an article about a rash of sightings that happened while we were in middle school. Anyway, we both believe that that's why we were so creeped out by the woods outside of our house, that there was probably a Bigfoot, maybe more than one, living out there. I never connected all of these weird things until I started listening to Bigfoot podcasts and stuff like that, but now that I've put the pieces together, I feel like I can't unsee it. My Experience at Pine Valley Cabin Let me share this freaky experience I had in a cabin up in Pine Valley, Utah. My buddy Jack and I decided to take a weekend trip for some hiking and fishing. Jack's uncle had this old cabin up there, said we could use it any time. The place was pretty rustic, tucked away in the woods, no Wi-Fi, no cell service. <laughs> exactly what we were looking for. So we get there, and the cabin is more off the grid than we expected. It's this old, creaky wooden structure surrounded by these tall pine trees. It had a real creepy vibe, but we shrugged it off, excited for the weekend ahead. The first day was great. Hiking, fishing, the works. But as night fell, things started to get, well, weird. We were sitting by the fire, telling stories and having a few beers, when we heard this strange noise. It was like a soft tapping coming from the side of the cabin. We figured it was probably just an animal or the wind. Later, when we were bunking down, the tapping started again. This time it was followed by what sounded like whispering. It was so faint that I thought I was imagining it. I asked Jack if he had heard it and he just laughed and said I was trying to scare him. I tried to sleep, but the whispering continued, growing louder and then softer. I couldn't make out what was being said. It was like someone was right outside the window. I got up to check, half expecting to see somebody peering in, but there was nothing. Just the dark, quiet woods. The next morning we joked about it, blaming the wind or maybe one too many beers but inside, I think we both felt a bit uneasy. I don't know about you, but I've never had so many beers that I hallucinated. We spent the day outdoors trying to shake off the weirdness of the night before. The second night, though, was worse. Both of us woke up to the sound of footsteps outside. They were heavy, like someone was pacing back and forth on the porch and was fairly irritated. I remember just feeling frozen listening to those steps, wondering if we should go out and check. We mustered the courage to look outside, but again, nothing. No footprints, no sign of anyone being there. It was dead quiet, and the feeling of being watched was overwhelming. By morning, we had had enough. There was just something about that cabin, something so unsettling that we just couldn't explain. We packed up and left as soon as the sun came up. On the drive back, we talked about it. Jack admitted that his uncle had mentioned some weird stuff happening at the cabin before, but he never took it too seriously. He thought it was just old family tales and nothing more. I've done some camping and hiking in all kinds of places, but I have never experienced anything like that. There's something about that cabin in Pine Valley. Something, as my grandpa would say, that just don't feel right.
This is something that happened a while ago at a cabin that my family and I were renting. My sister and I were sitting outside on the back porch around 11 p.m., maybe getting closer to midnight. We were talking when we heard a noise. To me, it sounded like someone was clapping their hands, kind of like in The Conjuring, at least that's what it reminded me of. No one was outside, and the neighbors were pretty far down the road. So if it was someone, they would have had to walk all the way to the house and be standing pretty much right outside of it. The rest of my family were talking inside the kitchen. We could have heard them, and it would have been obvious if they were the ones clapping. It happened three times in three different locations. Once right next to the house, once in front of us, which would have been in the back, in the woods. And the third time came from the front of the house. I really don't know how to explain it, but it was pretty creepy. My story may not be the most exciting, but it's a personal experience that I have felt compelled to share. This incident took place in the summer of 2017, when my family was on vacation in California. It happened on the last leg of our journey, when we were on a road trip from San Francisco to Los Angeles to catch our flight back home. We had spent the day exploring John Steinbeck's family home in Salinas, and were en route back to LA. The afternoon sun was setting over golden vineyards that graced the valleys we were passing, casting a warm glow over the landscape. Packed into a rental van, my family was mostly sleeping, apart from my father who was at the wheel, my grandmother occupying the passenger seat, and me situated in the rear of the van. As we curved around a bend in the road, my father's voice rang out, what is that? Being at the back of the van, I could only catch a glimpse through his side of the van of a dark figure crossing the road from the left. I anticipated seeing the figure on my side of the van within moments. As we got closer, however, the figure shifted from an upright posture to walking on all fours before disappearing behind the hill. I strained my eyes to spot it reappearing from behind the hill but there was nothing. Given its size, equivalent to that of a man, there was no logical place for it to hide, leaving me bewildered. Both my father and I were puzzled, as he'd only ever seen the figure upright while focusing on the road. My grandmother, despite being at the front, seemed oblivious to the entire incident, perhaps lost in her own thoughts. My dad and I, both believers in the paranormal, have our theories about the figure. While he leaned toward it being a Sasquatch, I have contemplated the possibility of it being a skinwalker. This event remains my sole encounter with the paranormal to date, and it lingers on my mind. I still wonder about the identity of the figure we saw crossing the road that day. I am not really sure what's going on, but I wanted to throw this story out there to see if maybe somebody had any ideas. I've had sleep paralysis often for the past three years or so, and when I say often, I mean like three to five times a week. It's always a similar experience. I currently live at my mom's house with my son as I left my son's dad who was extremely abusive. I'm working hard to get back on my feet. I moved in with her last May, so the sleep paralysis happened before I moved back, whenever I was still with my son's father. 
The current setup of the room that my son and I sleep in is as follows. It's a very large loft room with a half bath and a small living room with a TV. My son has some insane separation anxiety, so he sleeps in the same room as me, and our beds are next to each other in a T-shape. I'm at the top and he's next to me sideways. Underneath the loft is one of my parents' three other living rooms. So every single time that this sleep paralysis happens, I see a young child, similar to the look of my son who's about six. The child has dirty blonde hair and is wearing some old looking dirty clothes, like as if he was a child from the 30s or 40s. I can't ever really see the eyes because the hair on his head is covering them. The child is just moving his hands up and down my right leg, and as he's stroking my leg, he's just staring at me with this huge smile, which has some really sharp teeth. All I think of when I wake up every morning is Cheshire the Cat from Alice in Wonderland. The child always asks me to call his mom as he's stroking my leg, either to call his mom or to get him a bunny salad. I don't even know what that is. And obviously I'm trying to move or scream and I can't. It's always the exact same thing that happens. So Monday night was the last time I had an instance of sleep paralysis. What I didn't know was that my mom was downstairs that night, starting to pass one of her kidney stones. She and I both have a kidney disease where we get infections and stones very often. So it's not out of the ordinary for her to be up in the middle of the night. She said it was about 3 a.m. and she could hear someone moving around in the loft, moving from the bathroom to the bed and then moving the bed around. So she walks up the steps but sees that both my son and I are dead asleep. So she goes back down the stairs and hears it again. This time it's right where my bed is. So she just stays on the steps, listening to the noises of somebody getting on and off my bed, but doesn't see anything. I guess she thought nothing of it and went back downstairs where she eventually fell asleep. The next morning she was telling me that she was hearing sounds in the loft and that's when I told her about my sleep paralysis. She just said, weird, and moved on with her day. I don't know what I'm dealing with here. I don't know if it's just my brain playing with me or what. I did find out later something very interesting though. Bunny salad was a thing in the 1930s. Food disguises were popular in the 30s, including pigs in blankets, mushrooms made out of cream cheese, and bunny salad made from a canned pear half. I think it's so crazy that bunny salad is actually something that existed. This kid told me about it multiple times and asked for it, but I had never heard about it before. The whole thing is just so unsettling. Back in the summer of 2020, I was traveling with my partner to Boise, Idaho from Colorado to visit his family and stay for a camping trip. This trek is nearly 15 hours long, and while you can do it in a day, it's better if you stop to rest. Having lived in Utah at one point in time, I was very eager to show him the natural hot springs in Spanish Fork. They're located deep in Diamond Fork Canyon and require a 45 minute hike from the parking lot. Still, we were both excited to get out and get moving after seven hours in the car. When we arrived at the first parking lot, however, the gate was shut and locked tight. A sign taped to the metal read, closed, absolutely no access to hot springs, fines $2,000 max or something to that effect. We were bummed. The virus had shut down many things and we figured that this was outside so there's no way they were going to close it. After some research on the government website, we discovered that a body had possibly been found in the hot springs and was likely the cause for the locked gate. Sad and tired of sitting in the car, we drove back down the canyon road to find a spot to camp for the night. 
Most of the more established campsites were closed due to the virus or were already taken for the night. This was fine since we prefer more dispersed camping anyway. So we picked a random road to turn on as we drove closer to exiting the canyon. Road 338. Most of the road was a well-kept dirt road. We passed some promising spots near a creek and maybe two or three other people were already set up for the night. We wanted to go a little farther to see if there was anything with that wow factor. Sounds funny, but some sites just give off that this is the one feeling. Finally, we came to a dead end in the main road with a fire mitigation road to the right. At this very spot, there was a strange boulder with some type of inscription on it. I had to investigate. The inscription read, Diamond Battle, June 20th, 1866. No way, a memorial for a battle that happened right here. A feeling of uneasiness and oddly respect washed over me. After traveling up the fire road and not finding what we were hoping for in a campsite, we decided to pick a spot by the small creek we passed on the way in. It was getting dark quickly, but we set up our tent in no time at all and got a fire going. The creek was loud but peaceful, though ever since I read that inscription, I couldn't shake this strange feeling. I'm not a paranoid person, but I kept feeling on the edge of my seat, like something was watching us from the woods just across the water. As the night grew darker, this feeling grew stronger. I decided I didn't want to be in the open anymore, and I retreated to the tent to get some rest while my partner stayed up to enjoy the fire. I snuggled into our sleeping bag and exhaled comfortably, listening to the creek that was now much quieter and was a bit farther from the tent. I started to drift off when I heard it. Soft chanting, rhythmic drums. My eyes shot open. Was I really hearing that? I strained my ears to listen over the running water. I couldn't quite get a clear sound, but it was definitely there. This is when I noticed the ground was also rumbling as if horses were stampeding down the road a hundred feet from our site. I didn't know if I should get out to tell my partner or not, but I had the strange feeling that if I said it out loud, it would make it more true, and that an army of spirits would spring from the trees and into our campsite or something. Before I could make the decision, I was dead asleep. This was somehow the most peaceful slumber I had ever had. The next morning, we packed up our tent and left no trace that we had ever spent the night by Little Diamond Creek. When I finally entered cell service, I did a Google search of that memorial and Diamond Fork, Utah. It turns out there was a battle there between the Utes and the Mormon militia, and lives were lost on that mountainside. After reading this, I decided to tell my partner what I heard last night before falling asleep. I told him about the chanting and the drumming and even the stomping of horses. He looked at me in total disbelief and said, I heard the same thing. I guess I was only in the tent for about 10 minutes before he got spooked, standing alone by the fire, hearing this distant chanting and drums. He came into the tent and experienced that same peaceful sleep that I had. I feel as though we were being watched over by some of the Native Americans that lost their lives there. A strong but calm and protective presence was there. If you're ever on Diamond Fork Road, I hope you visit and pay respects to the memorial of the Diamond Battle, and maybe the spirits of the land will watch over you too. The Night of Knocking Last fall, my friend Hannah and I decided to spend a weekend in a secluded cabin in the Cascades. 
It was an ideal spot for a beautiful, peaceful getaway. Or so we thought. The cabin, nestled in a thickly wooded area, was rustic and charming. The perfect escape from our busy city lives and corporate jobs. Our first day was uneventful, filled with hiking and enjoying the tranquil surroundings. As night fell, we settled in, lighting a fire and sharing stories. And that's when the banging started. It began as a soft thudding on the walls, so faint we thought it might be an animal outside. But as the night progressed, the banging grew louder and more persistent, echoing around the entire cabin. It was as if someone, or something, was circling the cabin, pounding on the walls with relentless intensity. We were terrified, huddling together in the living room. Every time we mustered the courage to peek outside, we saw nothing but the dark, dense forest. And in some ways, that made it all worse. The banging continued, rhythmic and unyielding, creating a symphony of terror that made it impossible to think straight, let alone sleep. We sat wide-eyed and anxious, waiting for dawn. When the first light of morning finally broke, the banging stopped abruptly. We cautiously stepped outside, our nerves on edge. That's when we saw them. Footprints encircling the cabin. But these were not ordinary footprints. They were large, misshapen, with too many toes, and they didn't resemble any animal we knew. The sight of those bizarre, unidentifiable tracks sent a new wave of fear through us because whatever made them, we couldn't see. We packed up quickly, hardly speaking as we hurried to leave the cabin behind. The drive back was silent. I think we were both just trying to make sense of what had just happened to us. We never went back to that cabin. What was lurking in the woods? What was its intention? Maybe some questions are just better left unanswered. It was supposed to be a simple hiking trip in the Oregon wilderness, a break from hectic work life. I stumbled upon the cabin purely by chance, a quaint structure seemingly untouched by time, hidden in a dense part of the forest. The first night was peaceful, with only the sounds of the forest to keep me company. But when I woke up the next morning, something felt off. The calendar on the wall showed the same date as the day before. I brushed it off as a mistake, until I realized that everything outside was exactly as I had found it the previous day. The same fallen branch on the path, which I had picked up and moved. The same pattern of mist swirling in the trees. As the day progressed, it became clear that I was reliving the same day. When night fell, eerie things started to happen. Shadows danced in the corners of the room, and faint whispers echoed through the cabin, though nobody was there to make them. The next morning it happened again, the same date, the same unchanging scenery. But this time I noticed something new, a hidden compartment in the floorboards containing a diary. The diary belonged to a woman who had lived in the cabin decades ago. Each repeating day, I uncovered more of her story. She wrote about her lover, a soldier who was supposed to return from war. But as days turned into years, his letter stopped, and Emily, the author, was left waiting, her heart growing heavy with uncertainty and sorrow. Nightly, the cabin seemed to replay fragments of her emotions. The whispers seemed to be fragments of her prayers for her lover's return. The shadows were manifestations of her growing despair. On what felt like the tenth repetition of the same night, I found a final entry in the diary that I hadn't seen before. It was written in a shaky hand, the ink blurred by what I assumed were tears. 
Emily had learned of her lover's death. Her hopes shattered. Overcome with grief, she could not bear the weight of living in a world without him. I realized that the cabin was stuck in a time loop, echoing Emily's last days of heartache. That night, I spoke to the cabin, to Emily's lingering spirit. I told her that everything was different now, and that if she was waiting for him, he wouldn't find her here. He would be where she should go, the other side, whatever that is. The next morning, I finally awoke to change. The calendar had moved forward one day. The forest seemed different, alive with sounds and movements that had been absent before. And the diary was gone. A couple of years ago, my boyfriend and I were in the woods, near a dam. It was about 3 a.m., and we were just pulling an adventurous all-nighter and enjoying each other's company. The area is located in the south shore of Massachusetts. As I've said, there's a dam with a stone wall and an area with picnic tables nearby. There's a path that goes into the woods. Lots of people fish here and it seems like a pretty benign place. I've been here many times during the day, but never at night. We made our way to the path and went into the woods. We found a stone bench and were there for quite a while, when suddenly we heard what sounded like a large grunt or exhale. We stayed silent for a moment and waited until we heard it again, grunting and exhaling repeatedly. My boyfriend said, Whatever it is has big lungs. We could hear it moving, not toward us, but almost as if it were passing us to the left, then to the right. It sounded close enough to get to us, but it never showed itself. We didn't run out, but proceeded at a regular pace down the path that would bring us out. The noises continued as we left and sounded farther and farther away, so it didn't follow us. There are certainly bears in Massachusetts, but not in this area. I even went on Google Maps to see if there was a farm nearby or something, but there wasn't. I cannot understand what this was, but whatever it was, sounded beastly. The Hike That Never Ended My encounter on the trails of Mount San Antonio in California, also known as Mount Baldy, still sends shivers down my spine. I've always been an avid hiker, seeking out nature's challenges. Mount Baldy, with its rugged beauty and challenging trails, seemed like the perfect weekend escape. But that weekend turned into a surreal, never-ending loop of confusion and fear. I started my hike early in the morning, the sun just beginning to cast its golden hues over the landscape. The trail was clear, and I was well prepared with supplies and a map. I planned to reach the summit and return before dusk. The ascent was breathtaking, both in its scenic beauty and in its physical demand. I reached the summit by early afternoon, feeling a sense of accomplishment as I took in the panoramic view. After a short rest, I began my descent, expecting it to be straightforward. But as I hiked down, an unsettling fog began to roll in, thick and disorienting. I checked my compass and map frequently, but something seemed off. The trail markers, once clear, now became sporadic and hard to follow. The landscape, so familiar on my ascent, felt strangely different. Hours passed, and I should have been nearing the base, but the trail just kept going. The fog grew denser, and a chilling sense of isolation set in. I tried to retrace my steps, thinking I might have taken a wrong turn, but the path behind me was just as confusing. 
As night fell, I realized I was lost. The fog was so thick now that my flashlight barely cut through it. I decided to stop and set up a makeshift camp, hoping to wait out the fog until morning. But the strangest part came with the dawn. When the sun rose, the fog lifted, revealing not the familiar trails of Mount Baldy, but an unrecognizable dense forest. I was on a completely different path, one I had no recollection of taking. My map was useless here. Panicked, I started walking, hoping to find my way out or run into another hiker. But the forest seemed endless, the trees a repeating pattern of eerie similarity. I walked for hours, but it felt like I wasn't making any progress at all. It was as if the forest was reshaping itself around me. Then I heard voices, distant and echoing. They seemed to be calling my name. I followed them thinking that it might be other hikers or a search party looking for me, but the voices led me in circles, always out of reach, their whispers tinged with an unsettling familiarity. By the time I found my way out of the forest, it was night again. I emerged onto a trail that led me back to the base of Mount Baldy. How I got there, or where I had been, I still can't explain. I was found by a park ranger, who told me I had been missing for two days. They'd been searching for me, thinking that I had fallen or injured myself. The experience on Mount Baldy has left me bewildered and deeply unsettled. I've hiked those trails before and since, and nothing like that has ever happened again. I can't explain the shifting landscape, the endless forest, or the voices that seem to echo out of nowhere. The hike on Mount Baldy was more than just a physical journey. It was a brush with something I have no way of understanding. And whatever it was, it will be with me forever. In the summer of 2012, I took a job as an expedition canoe guide on the Boundary Waters. It was in northern Minnesota, southern Ontario. This is a massive wilderness area of lakes and land. I was working for the Boy Scouts, and we were based on Moose Lake, on the U.S. side. My job was to facilitate a fun and safe multi-day trip, anywhere from 7 to 12 days out. Most of that summer was typical, but one expedition in particular still haunts me as a result of what happened to us over the course of a few days. Here's the account in full. My crew was on the younger side. There were nine of us in total, the maximum allowed in a group per our permit. There were six scouts, two adult advisors or scoutmasters, and myself. They had wanted to do a 200 miler, but didn't have the physical ability so we had to amend our route. They were bummed out, so I decided to take them to a waterfall called Eddy Falls. It's pretty flat up there, so a waterfall is somewhat rare, but that decision would end up putting us in the path of something. We visited the falls and camped near to it. That evening, I had the boys working on camp setup while the advisors worked on fire for dinner. I was collecting firewood in a big tangle of downed trees, brush, and bramble. I could faintly hear the falls off to my left, when out of nowhere, I hear the most unearthly scream or roar I've ever heard. It stopped me dead in my tracks, and I was frozen. The second scream was closer, and the third was closer still. I couldn't see anything due to the thickness of the brush, but whatever this was, it was coming directly at me. By the fourth scream, I could feel it in my chest. I got really nauseated, and involuntarily, I barked at it. I've never before or since heard that sound come out of my body. The fifth scream almost physically hurt, but it snapped me back to reality and I ran back to camp. My crew had heard it too, but what was I supposed to tell them? I claimed that it was a boar. There are no boar up there, 
and the advisors knew that I was lying, but they didn't call my bluff. After dinner, they went to their tents, and I retired to my hammock, about 50 yards from camp. As a rule, I always set my hammock at head height, so about six feet up. I would use a tarp over my body and head to keep the morning dew off and the morning mosquitoes at bay. But the tarp wasn't strung up. That's important. It was just loosely over me. It must have been around three to four in the morning when I was awakened by what sounded to me like a woman sobbing. Not an outright cry, but a sob. At the same time, I'm hearing something walking through the thick brush down past my feet. So I listen, totally still and quiet, as it crosses into camp. I could hear the change from brush to granite rock, but could still hear its heavy footfalls as it walked right through camp and on toward me. At this point, the tarp is still over my head, so I can't see a thing and I don't know what to do. In no time, it was standing right next to me. I could hear the breathing, loud and congested sounding. I could smell the musk. I could feel its enormous presence only inches from my body, just standing there. Time to make a decision. I suddenly threw the tarp off my head, and as I did this, my left hand touched the thing in the chest. It was dark, but I could make out briefly a very large upright figure. The hair on it was long and coarse. The musculature was impressive. Bodybuilder status pectoral is what I touched. It all happened in a second, and as soon as my hand made contact, it bolted back into the brush with immense speed for such thick debris. By the time I got my headlamp on, it was gone. My crew had slept through it all, so I read until the sun came up and decided not to mention it. The next day we moved on a few miles toward base camp and camped on a small island. Campsites on the U.S. side are designated by a fire pit and a grumper, which is a fiberglass toilet over a deep hole. We were just arriving and it was evening. One of the adult advisors needed to visit the grumper, so he walked toward it. About two minutes later, we heard him yelling, and he came running back to camp, still pulling his pants up. He said that he had just seen a gorilla run right in front of him. I asked if maybe it was a bear, and he said absolutely not, that he'd hunted bear for years and it was no bear. It was a monkey, and it was about nine feet tall. At this height estimate, I'm imagined being back in my hammock, if I touched the chest, and I was about six feet off the ground, that puts the head close to nine feet up. Was it stalking us? Was there more than one? The boys are now scared. Time to mitigate. I suggest a night paddle. No one's sleeping anymore anyway, so we pack back up and set out at around 8 p.m. and paddled by headlamp for several miles. My plan was to get back onto Moose Lake and camp very near to base so we could be the first crew off water the following day. Moose Lake is connected to Newfound Lake by a small pinch and a channel of water that's not very deep or wide. There are dark woods on both sides. We were right in the middle of the pinch when a rock the size of a basketball came flying out of the woods on the right side and narrowly missed the bow of the canoe that I was steering. There's no cliff there. This thing was forcefully thrown at us from the tree line. At this, we paddled like hell. We paddled to the center of Moose Lake, tied all three canoes together, and sat out there all night. With the sunrise, we paddled to base camp and ended our expedition. They didn't want to talk about what happened, and I was okay with that. They left for Oklahoma the next day. After they left, I went to work a shift in the canoe yard helping crews offload. My buddy Justin got back that day from a trip in the same area that we'd been in, Bear Loop. And as I was helping him put a boat on the rack, I noticed he had a distant look, almost a thousand yard stare. I asked how his trip went, 
and he said it was all good until they hit Knife Lake or Newfound Lake. He said that they were being messed with for two nights on Knife and then had a rock thrown at them in the Newfound Pinch. Sure enough, for a solid two weeks after that, crews kept coming back from that area with very similar stories. One night, there was a crowd of us guides in the staff lodge swapping trail stories, and these encounters came up, one after another. Screams, rocks, sightings of apes. Then from the back corner of the room, I hear a chuckle. It's one of the old veteran guides who'd been there for over a decade. All he said was, it's about time somebody else seen one. I asked how long he'd known they were there. He said he's been encountering them for 10 years. Then he said, they talk to me. This shocked me. Like a language? I asked. Nah, they communicate telepathically. The less you acknowledge them, the less they'll bother you, but they can read you. And they like it when you're afraid. It's a game to them. What happened out there is still a big question in my mind. I've always been open to the idea of Sasquatch. Their existence was never a huge stretch for me. But what really sticks with me is the way that veteran guide spoke of their intelligence and parapsychological abilities that they can read human emotion as clear as pages in a book, that they know our species better than we know ourselves. My creepy night in the black pine forest. All right, so let me tell you about this super weird thing that happened to me and my buddy Alex in the Black Pine Forest. I don't know its real name, but that's what we called it. We're both pretty chill about ghost stories and all, but this experience was next level. We hit up the forest for a weekend hike. It's got these massive pine trees and it's usually a peaceful spot, but locals sometimes chat about it being kind of spooky we didn't pay much attention to those stories. Day one was all hiking, setting up camp and the usual stuff, nothing out of the ordinary. The forest was alive with nature sounds, but when night came, things got super quiet. It was just me, Alex, who knocked out early, and our campfire. I wasn't ready to sleep, so I stepped outside the tent for some air, and then I heard something really strange, like whispers. Not the wind or animals, but actual whispering. It was coming from the trees around our camp. I was curious and okay, a bit freaked out, but I had to check it out. I grabbed my flashlight and headed into the trees. The whispers got louder as I got closer. It was like a bunch of people talking all at once, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. It was super eerie. As I moved deeper into the forest, the whispers seemed to surround me. I felt this chill, and not just because it was night. It was like someone or something was watching me. I kept going, thinking maybe I'd find some kids pranking campers or something. But nope, there was nobody there. Then the whispering just stopped. Like, completely. One second it was there, the next total silence. I stood there, flashlight in hand, feeling my heart racing. I didn't know whether to bolt back to camp or keep looking around. After what felt like ages, I decided to head back. I didn't mention anything to Alex because I didn't want to freak him out, but I barely slept that night, listening for any more whispers, which thankfully didn't come back. The next day we packed up and hiked back. I did a little bit of digging and found out that Black Pine Forest was known for this kind of thing. Stories of unexplained sounds, shadows, and even ghost sightings. I wish I knew that before, but honestly, it probably wouldn't have stopped us. So yeah, that's my creepy story from the woods. No idea what those whispers were, but it's something I'll never forget.
I have started with a new routine, so I bought a bike. Decided that I would go on an 11 p.m. to midnight stroll before heading home to sleep. Suffice to say, I didn't after this. There's a canal system in Glasgow perfect for cycling, so I followed it quite far out, with my light and bell at the ready in case I crossed paths with someone, although that's probably not likely given the time of night. I got off my bike at a bench. Behind this bench there's a brick wall, and behind those bricks were disused railway tracks, decommissioned in the 1950s. My phone started to play up, and the light from my phone seemed a bit weaker than usual. I followed the light across the muddy canal, and to my horror, I saw what looked like a boy and a girl in the small island in the middle. I asked if they were okay, but I didn't get much of a response. I asked again if they needed my help, or if I could call the fire brigade or police or whatever. Just as I said that, my phone died. I now only had the moonlight to go on. Remembering the light from my bike, I turned it on and scanned the area again. There was no one there. Thank God nothing came out of this other than that. I was absolutely shitting myself on the way home. I cycled home and freaked out a bit, turned my phone on, and when I got home, it had 61% battery. So what the hell happened? Nobody believes me, but I guess I don't expect them to. I would like to know what the heck I saw, though. I went on a little hiking trip with my dad to Shasta, California, a small town in Northern California near the Oregon border. Shasta is home to a potentially active volcano, named, of course, Mount Shasta. There are many trails on Mount Shasta, so my father and I were excited to do some hiking. We drove up the side of the mountain to the parking lot, in which one of the trails begins. I believe it was called the Old Ski Bowl Trail. The landscape was a very barren incline filled with rocks, boulders, dirt, and very few trees. About an hour into the trail we came across a very odd assembly of these large boulders. They were arranged in a circle. We thought it was strange, but we continued on. If you look up pictures of the trail, you'll see much smaller rocks arranged in patterns and circles. My father and I only encountered three people. At least, that's what they appeared to be at first. The first two were a father and son. We met them on a steep incline that went along the wall of a cliff that would then switch back as it reached the top of the cliff. We stopped and said hello, talked about the trail, and then went along our separate ways. Here's where it gets weird. Dad and I kept walking up the incline for just about two minutes. I turned around and I saw the father and son so far down the trail. It should have taken them at least 20 minutes to get down to where they were, but somehow they were there in only two minutes. To this day, I have absolutely no idea how that could have happened. There was no one else on the trail at that point, and I could see the color of their clothing from that distance, so I knew it was them. I pointed it out to my dad, we thought it was weird, but we didn't dwell on it, and we kept going. Here's where it gets so much weirder. As we reached the top of the cliff, there was another strange rock arrangement that was off to the side of the trail. This time, there were far more rocks than before and they were now arranged in rows, almost like gravestones. We continued on the trail and reached another sort of incline with a switchback to reach the top of yet another cliff. We reached a point where we would need climbing gear to continue, so we decided to head back. When we turned around, I saw a man standing among the rocks, staring at us. He was wearing a button-up shirt, cargo shorts, and a wide-brimmed straw hat. He was at a distance where I should have been able to make out his facial features, but it was almost as if he had none, like his face was just flesh and skin. I pointed him out to my dad, and then the man quickly ducked down behind a boulder and was peering out at us over the top of it. It seemed almost playful, like a child trying to play hide and seek. For a few moments I was out of it, and I have no recollection of what was going on. 
According to my dad, I just started walking toward this man in the hat. My dad was calling out to me, Joshua, Josh, what are you doing? Where are you going? And then I came to. I was standing right at the edge of a cliff. It was a huge drop, enough to kill me or seriously injure me. My dad grabbed me and pulled me back to the trail. He told me to stay put, and my dad went down to the boulders to search for the man. But he wasn't there. There was nowhere for him to go except up or down the trail. It didn't make any sense. He just disappeared. I have no idea what was going on on that trail, and I have no explanation for it. I have told this story many times to family and friends, and no one else has an explanation either. I've done research and I've found similar stories about encounters with a man with no facial features wearing a hat. I've also read that the Native American tribes from the area viewed Mount Shasta as a holy site. They believe that it could act as a portal to another dimension, and that it's guarded by spirits who would potentially harm anybody who tried to go up to the volcano. If anybody has any similar experiences or any insight at all, I would love to hear. I was out in the garden with a friend when my partner, we'll call him Bob, called our dog. Let's call him Spot. Just his name. Spot started running toward his name and then stopped dead in his tracks. In the same amount of time that it took Spot to hear his name and run a few steps, I thought, Bob is calling Spot. I wonder why. Wait, was that Bob? The last thought coming just as Spot stopped with one front leg grazed mid-step. My friend and I looked at each other, eyebrows raised. Did you just hear that? I asked. Yeah, it was Bob calling Spot, my friend replied, a bit dubious. You see, Bob was about a hundred yards away, last I knew, and his voice seemed to come from closer and to the right of where I thought he was. Feeling something was off, I yelled, Bob, did you call Spot? He responded, what? From where I had thought that he was, and also because he's a bit hard of hearing. Trying to be heard, I yelled, did you call Spot? To which he replied, Spot, thinking that I was asking him to call the dog. Instantly though, Spot takes off running in the direction of actual Bob. My friend and I look at each other with more eyebrow raising and agree that that was really weird. Ten minutes later, when Bob joined us in the garden, I asked him if he had called Spot earlier. He said, yeah, you told me to. I said, no, before that, before I yelled to you. He said no, and he thought it was weird that I was asking him to call Spot. So I told him what happened and clarified everything, and he immediately guessed that it was a raven mimicking him calling our dog. I was a little suspicious assuming that a raven could even sound exactly like him, or at least enough alike to fool myself, my friend, and the dog. Also, we've never heard the ravens talk before. Fast forward three weeks, when I mention this to my friend in a group of people, and how I have never been creeped out at our place before, but that I can't stop thinking about that. He says, me too. Then suddenly remembering, he turned to Bob and said, earlier today when you walked up the hill, did you call for Nick? Referring to his partner, who was also visiting. Bob said, no, I don't think I've ever called for Nick. My friend then relates a similar story to ours, hearing Bob call for Nick, but not from where he thought Bob should be, feeling doubtful then going to find Nick to see if he'd heard it too, and he hadn't. This happened outside, and we live in a fairly remote place in Northern California, National Forest borders three sides of our property, and we have neighbors to the north of us. None of the neighbors are close enough to hear, and they don't sound like Bob. I looked into corvids, as we have many, including ravens and stellar jays. The first one could be explained by this. Bob calls Spot often enough that it's not too far-fetched that a corvid could have been mimicking that, although I still doubt it would have sounded exactly like him. 
The second one is a bit harder for everyone involved to swallow. Bob hasn't said Nick's name very often on our property, mostly just in the last week that they've been visiting, and certainly he's never called to him. I also looked into cryptids. I was told once that the natives believed an entity lived on the mountain that I now live on. I wasn't told much, just that it was neither good nor bad, but that the natives stayed well away from there. Any thoughts on what this might be? First things first, you should know that I am a skeptic, and I don't believe in things without evidence. I prefer to think rationally, and I'll try to debunk anything before I put too much stock in it. I do, however, have a story that I can't explain. In 2010, I was in my early 20s living in Southern California and working for a computer and phone company with big fancy mall stores. Come on, you probably know the one, right? We nicknamed it the Fruit Stand. Anyway, we'd just come out with a new phone that was in high demand. Part of working in this store was giving a personalized experience to each customer who purchased a product and helping them get it set up if they so desired. One day, I remember taking a customer for a new phone. The man was very tall and very thin. He had long blonde and gray hair and very defined features, prominent cheekbones and a very pronounced chin. I also remember his clothing was very formal. He wore a black suit with a white shirt, not something you would often see in sunny San Diego. The man looked to be somewhere in his late fifties to maybe mid-sixties. His hair was graying and thinning, and he was quite pale. During the transaction, it was clear that money was no issue. He picked up one of every single accessory that I suggested. You always knew rich people from how they dropped cash on expensive products that they didn't need or understand. He happily agreed to the insurance program for the phone and the other membership services that we were selling as well. The normal process to sell a phone requires the customer's driver's license and credit card. To activate the phone on their phone line, we needed to put in their license information and have them give some info to access their account and check for their upgrade. Once I had his driver's license, I discovered a birthday of 1915. This man was 95 years old. At the time, I should have been really surprised, but it was like I didn't even consider it. I think I just politely told him that he looked very good for his age. We finished the transaction, I set him up with everything, and his demeanor was calm and friendly. It wasn't until looking back that I realized how strange it was that he was 95 years old, but looked to be so much younger and also how not shocked I was at the strangeness of the situation at the time. I now joke that I once met a real-life vampire, because that's honestly the closest thing I can identify him with. Pale, not aging, and somehow charming me into not being stunned by his age or the strangeness of the situation. Whatever he was, I do think I was hypnotized to some degree, and that he was not just a 95-year-old human. The Shadow at Priest Lake. My unsettling encounter during a camping trip in northern Idaho near Priest Lake remains a vivid memory. Priest Lake, with its crystal clear waters and dense forests, is a haven for campers and hikers. I went there with a group of friends for a weekend getaway, unaware of the eerie experience that awaited us. We set up camp in a remote area near the lake shore. The first day was perfect, kayaking, fishing, and exploring the surrounding wilderness. As the sun set, we gathered around the campfire, sharing stories and enjoying the tranquil beauty of the lake. That night, after we had all settled into our tents, I was awakened by a strange noise outside. It sounded like whispers, but disjointed and inconsistent. 
Thinking it might be one of my friends, I stepped out of the tent. The campfire was out, and the moon cast a pale light over the campsite. The whispers stopped abruptly, and I noticed something moving at the edge of the forest. It was a shadowy figure, just beyond the reach of the moonlight. It seemed to be watching us. I called out, thinking maybe somebody was lost and needed help. But the figure didn't respond. Instead, it slowly retreated into the trees. I woke up a couple of my friends, and we tried to find the figure with our flashlights, but it was gone. We were all a bit spooked, and nobody slept much that night. The next day, we asked around at other campsites and even talked to a park ranger, but no one else had seen anything unusual. We tried to brush it off, but the encounter had left us feeling uneasy. That night, the whispers returned, more coherent this time, as if someone, or something, was speaking in a language we couldn't understand. Again, the shadowy figure appeared at the edge of the forest, but this time it was closer. It was tall and thin, and it almost blended into the trees. We all put our flashlight beams on it, but the light seemed to just pass right through, as if the figure was made of smoke. As quickly as it showed up, it vanished, and we were left in stunned silence. We decided to leave in the morning, cutting our trip short. It was just too unsettling to ignore, and none of us could get any sleep anyway. We packed up our gear, still glancing around, a little bit nervous of the tree line. Since that trip, I've heard some stories from other campers I know about strange sightings near Priest Lake, tales of shadowy figures and unexplained whispers in the night. Some say it's just the wind or animals, but Others believe it's something a little bit more ominous. Whatever it was, we're never going back. The Forgotten Campsite it all started as a weekend camping trip with my two best friends, Alex and Jenna, in the remote woods of Oregon. We had planned this getaway for weeks, aiming for a spot known as the Forgotten Campsite, named so due to its seclusion and the tales that hikers occasionally stumbled upon it by chance. We set out early, our backpacks laden with the essentials, the excitement palpable among us. The hike to the campsite was challenging but beautiful taking us through dense forests and along a meandering river. By late afternoon, we found it, a small clearing with an old rusted fire ring at its center, the ground flattened by previous campers. We set up our tents and gathered wood for a fire. As night fell, we cooked dinner over the flames, sharing stories and laughter under the starlit sky. Everything was perfect, or so it seemed. Later, as we settled into our tents, a sense of unease crept over me. The forest, lively with sounds during the day, was eerily silent, as if all the nocturnal creatures had suddenly vanished. I tried to sleep, attributing my unease to the new surroundings. In the middle of the night, I was awakened by a faint whispering outside my tent. At first, I thought it was Alex or Jenna, but a quick glance showed them both asleep. I listened, heart racing, as the whispering grew louder, a chorus of indistinct voices that seemed to encircle our campsite. I nudged Alex awake and he heard it too. We cautiously unzipped the tent, half expecting to find somebody playing a prank, but the clearing was empty, the whispering voices now fading away into the night. The next morning, we discussed the event. Jenna, a very heavy sleeper, had heard nothing. Alex and I were perplexed, but decided that it might have been the wind or some nocturnal animal. As the day progressed, we tried to put the incident behind us, exploring the nearby woods and river. But the sense of unease lingered, a shadow over our previously cheerful spirits. 
That night, the whispering returned, more coherent this time. We could almost make out words, but not in any language that we recognized. This time, Jenna heard it too. Terrified, we huddled together in one tent, none of us daring to step outside. The next day, we decided to cut our trip short. As we hurriedly packed our gear, I noticed something strange. Small stone-like objects arranged in a circle around our campsite. They had not been there before. The arrangement was deliberate, almost ritualistic. We left the forgotten campsite with more questions than answers. Who had whispered in the night? What did the stone circle signify? Our search for answers in the following weeks turned up nothing. This camping trip, meant to be an escape from the mundane, which I suppose it was, turned into an ordeal that we still talk about to this very day. The Message by the Hearth My family's decision to spend our vacation in a quaint old cabin in the Appalachian foothills seemed like the perfect way to disconnect from a crazy world. It was just me, my parents, and my younger brother Lucas. The cabin was rustic and charming, nestled in a secluded spot surrounded by dense woods. Our first evening was spent playing board games and enjoying the warmth of the crackling fireplace. As the clock struck midnight, the room chilled suddenly. That's when we saw her, a ghostly figure of a woman standing by the fireplace. She was ethereal, her form barely more than a wisp of smoke, yet unmistakably human. Each night she returned. She never spoke, only stared into the fire with a wistful, sorrowful expression. Her eyes, full of unspoken stories, seemed to plead for something. My parents were really freaked out, but I felt drawn to her. I wanted to know her story, to understand her silent message, to know what kept her by that fire. I began researching the history of the cabin. The local library held dusty records and old newspaper clippings that told a tale of tragedy. A century ago, the cabin was home to a young woman named Abigail. Her lover, a soldier, had left for war and promised to return. Abigail waited years, but he never came back. Heartbroken, she spent her remaining days in the cabin, always hoping for his return. It seemed clear to me that the ghostly woman was Abigail. Each night, I tried to communicate with her, to let her know that her lover wouldn't return and she should move on. But she only gazed into the fire, lost in her own world. On our last night, I tried something different. I sat by the fireplace, speaking gently about the world outside, how time had moved on. I told her it was okay to let go, that her lover's spirit had probably moved on and was likely waiting for her so she could move on too. As I spoke, a change came over Abigail. She turned to look at me, a faint smile on her lips. For a moment, the room filled with a warm, peaceful light. And then, she faded away, leaving nothing but a feeling of serenity. We left the cabin the next day. I don't know if Abigail found peace or if she simply chose to stop appearing to us. But I like to believe that she moved on, that our presence and understanding helped free her from her century-long wait. The memory of Abigail and her silent, sorrowful watch by the fireplace remains with me, and I think it probably always will. The Vanishing Camper I've camped in many places, but nothing compares to the experience I had last summer in the deep woods. 
It was a secluded forest in the Pacific Northwest, known for its old growth trees and pristine lakes. This trip, which I embarked on alone, left me with an eerie story and a lingering sense of really not knowing what I encountered. I arrived at the woods on a sunny afternoon, found a spot near a small lake and set up camp. The first day passed peacefully, filled with hiking and enjoying the solitude. As night fell, I built a fire, cooked a simple meal and relaxed under the stars. That night, I was awoken by the sound of footsteps outside my tent. I assumed it was a deer or some other animal, so I ignored it and tried to get back to sleep. But then I heard a voice, a man's voice, calling out softly, Hello? Is someone there? Curious and a little bit concerned, I got out of my tent. A few yards away stood a man. He looked to be in his 40s, dressed in camping gear, and a bewildered look on his face. He told me that his name was Tom and that he had gotten lost while hiking. He asked if he could share my fire as his supplies were low. Cautiously, I agreed. We sat by the fire and Tom shared his story. He said he'd been hiking for days, unable to find his way back to any familiar trail. His story struck me as odd. How could someone survive that long being so lost? But I chalked it up to luck and a survival instinct and probably years of experience. The next morning, Tom was gone. His disappearance was as sudden as his arrival. No trace of him remained, not even footprints. It was as though he just vanished into thin air sometime during the night. A little weirded out by this, I decided to hike back to the ranger station. I mentioned Tom and described his appearance and situation. I thought the ranger might be concerned and jot down some notes, but instead he was shocked. He showed me a missing person poster. It was Tom, but the poster was old, dated five years ago. Tom had gone missing in these woods and had never been found. Chills ran down my spine as I looked at the poster. The man I had spoken to, the man who had shared my fire, was a missing person lost to these woods years ago. How could that be? Was it a ghost, a figment of my imagination, some overlap of reality or something else entirely? That encounter with Tom was something I just couldn't explain. And that experience has stayed with me forever. Sleigh Bells Ring by J.R. Our eerie encounter in the Smoky Mountains started as a group camping trip aimed at exploring the natural beauty and rugged terrain of one of America's most beloved national parks. But what we experienced over those few nights has left each of us questioning the reality of the wilderness that surrounds us. Our group, five in total, set up camp in a secluded area, surrounded by dense forests and a clear view of the starry sky. The first day was an adventure, filled with hiking and sightseeing and everything we had gone there for. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire, shared some stories, and were pretty much just enjoying the peaceful ambiance of the mountains. Then we started to hear a noise. We all kind of sat up and looked around, trying to figure out what it was. It was ringing, like the sound of small bells echoing throughout the forest. It was faint, but distinct, encircling our campsite. It was kind of close to Christmas, and so we kind of joked about it, making up stories of Santa or forest fairies or lost hikers with jingle bells. But as the ringing continued, a sense of unease settled over us. Eventually, we shrugged it off as a quirk of the forest. Maybe somebody had weird wind chimes on a cabin somewhere, or maybe it was some kind of natural phenomenon. We figured we'd look it up when we got home and thought nothing of it. 
We went to bed, and even though it was kind of strange, the sound of the bells did sort of lull us to sleep. The next morning, we found something that turned the whole ordeal from something whimsical to something downright scary. Right in the middle of our campsite, there lay a single sleigh bell, old and slightly rusted. None of us had seen it before, none of us owned anything like it, and none of us could explain how it got there. The sight of it, so out of place this deep in the wilderness, was deeply unsettling. Every single night of our trip, the scenario repeated. The distant ringing of bells, always starting at nightfall and continuing until dawn. Every morning, we would find another singular sleigh bell in the middle of camp. We searched the area, thinking maybe somebody was playing a prank on us, but we never found another sign of a human presence anywhere. Our conversations about the bells became more serious and speculative. We discussed everything from pranksters to supernatural explanations, but none of it made sense. The Smoky Mountains are rich with folklore and legends, but none that we knew of mentioned mysterious bells. On our last night, the ringing was louder, more insistent. It felt like whatever was making the noise was getting closer and more intentional. We barely slept, the sound of bells consuming our thoughts. In the morning, we found not one, but several sleigh bells scattered around our tents, one for each of us, to be exact. We packed up and left the mountains with more questions than we dared to admit, more questions than any of us really wanted answers to. We talked about reporting it, but what on earth would we say? We were stalked by Santa? It sounded absurd even to us. Hey, we'd like to report sleigh bells in the woods and random bells in our campsite. I mean, come on. Ever since that trip, we've all stayed in touch. Occasionally, we bring up the bells and our theories. Some of us have tried to research similar occurrences, but so far we've come up empty-handed. So here we are, asking if anybody else has experienced this in the Smoky Mountains. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take and packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and I jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning, and I hike for about 15 to 20 miles until I find the right spot, and I head off the trail to find a place to put up my tent. I stumble upon this nice-sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer, with a lame leg as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and I go back to eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep yet, so I pull out a book I brought with me and I start to read by the light of the lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down, and I listen to this animal walk-drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing, and stops, and I hear nothing. 
No breathing, I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing. There's nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip up the tent and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and I tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter, and then sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm really hearing is what I'm really hearing, or if it's just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other directions, all different. Old men, old women, younger people, even children. And I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a little bit and figuring that I scared off whoever it was, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and I listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost. So I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame like a flamethrower erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the whole way. I never heard anyone follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way out, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, just like I left all my gear in the woods that night. For my lady's birthday, I took her to Gatlinburg, a popular, touristy, one main boardwalk town in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. We camped the first night, a few miles out in the woods at a popular location, Elkmet Campground. The campground was beautiful, tall green trees like baby redwoods, a clear water river scattered by checkered rocks, families with little ones running around, it was great. Through borrowing a tent, we found that we had no steaks and headed into town for supplies, whiskey, and hot dogs. It was dusk by the time we made it back to the campground. Most campers were surrounding their dissipating fires or cleaning up before the quickly coming night. Our tent was still up, but crunched up a little without the steaks allowing it to spread open as widely as it could. We fixed our tent and started a fire. As our night progressed, we found ourselves surrounding our campfire two to three hours later around midnight. Now, this was a sort of campground where another campsite is just 30 yards from yours. Bears frequent the area, and my girlfriend was already freaking out a little bit, which is why I booked our site in the dead center of the whole campground. All the other campers had gone to bed at this point, and the only sound we could hear was the slowly crackling fire and the light stream of the river flowing into the rocks. 
The clouds were covering a crescent moon, so there wasn't much light to begin with. We had flashlights, and I would occasionally shine the light around us while avoiding hitting the other campers to confirm that we were fine and that there were no bears. Seemingly out of nowhere, from the campsite behind my girlfriend and to my left, a light shined directly on us and then all around in a frantic yet focused manner, kind of like the Eye of Sauron. I saw what appeared to be a man with the strangest gait I've ever seen. He wore a headlight and was focused on his picnic table. The man's gait seemed to me to be a little bit like Jar Jar Binks, just not normal. I could see through my periphery that the man focused his light on the picnic table, and whenever I turned my head toward him, immediately his light would hit my girlfriend and I. I could only see the outline of the man through the light of his headlight and the occasional flash of my light at his campsite once he continued to flash his light at ours in a very disconcerting way. This was the campsite across from us, where we saw no one at all the night prior. I could only see the outline of his body as all black, as if he was in an all black bodysuit. His movements were eerily repetitious. For what went on to close to an hour, this man would shine his headlight on his picnic table, make limited motions with his hands, if any at all, then walk five steps back to his tent, shine his headlight at his tent, then walk back to the picnic table, shine his light at us, and repeat it all over again. If this was just the man looking for something, he was on a cocktail of drugs. Once his light was on us for too long for comfort, I shined my flashlight on him for an extended period of time. It was at this moment when I went from annoyed to fight or flight. A chill ran down my back as I saw the outline of the man disappear in front of me and the light from his headlight bounce down to the ground, then fly across the ground from his campsite. It seemed to jump along the ground and into the bushes diagonally from both of our campsites. It wasn't like the headlight had been thrown, but as if it ran across the ground like if it was on the head of a dog. I took my flashlight away and watched his light slowly come back out of the bushes and climb back up to the height of a person. The shadow figure returned back, walking out of the bushes and back to the campsite to continue the same odd behavior. There were no sounds at all coming from this figure throughout the entirety of the night. Some time later, we went into the tent for shut-eye, and the shadow man figure was still at his odd routine. The following day, the tent from the shadow man's campsite was gone, like no one had ever been there. I then found out that just a mile from our campsite was a small town called Elkmont Ghost Town, with abandoned buildings and a cemetery up a trail a bit. I couldn't find any other stories of Elkmont mysteries, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other stories involving the Headlight Man. The Night Visitor My camping trip to Starlight Camp a small, lesser-known site nestled in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, was supposed to be a weekend of relaxation. It turned out to be anything but. I arrived on a Friday afternoon, the campsite quiet with just a few other campers in the distance. I set up my tent in a cozy spot near a stream, looking forward to a weekend of fishing and reading. The first night was pretty peaceful filled with the sounds of the forest and the gentle flow of the stream. I fell asleep quickly, tired from the drive and the setup. I woke up sometime around midnight, unsure why at first. The fire had died down to glowing embers and the forest was silent, a bit too silent. And that's when I noticed the silhouette outside of my tent. It looked like a person standing there, motionless, Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I called out, asking if they needed help. There was no answer. Against my better judgment, I unzipped the tent slowly, my heart pounding. But as I looked out, the figure was gone. I scanned the area with my flashlight, but there was no sign of anyone. 
I had told myself it was probably just a trick of the shadows, or maybe another camper wandering by, and I just thought they were standing there. All the stupid things you tell yourself when you're trying to convince yourself that you didn't see what you just saw. The next day was uneventful, filled with fishing and exploring the nearby trails. I met a few other campers, but none of them seemed to be out late the previous night. That night I stayed up, curious to see if the silhouette would return. The hours ticked by, and just as I was about to give up and go to sleep, I saw it again. The same figure, standing at the edge of the campsite. This time I didn't hesitate. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped out of the tent. As I approached, the figure seemed to blur and shift, almost like a wisp of smoke caught in a gentle breeze. And then it just dissipated. I stood there, flashlight in hand, trying to make sense of it. There was nothing there, no tracks, no sign of anyone having been there at all. I didn't sleep much that night, my mind racing with questions. Was it a ghost, a trick of the light, my imagination. In the morning, I asked around, but again, none of the other campers had seen anything unusual or been out late. I left Starlight Camp with a mix of relief and curiosity. The experience of the night visitor was something I couldn't easily shake off. I suppose it wasn't threatening, but it was bizarre, an unexplained anomaly in an otherwise normal weekend, but it definitely left me more concerned than relaxed. I've thought about going back, maybe to try to see it again or to get some answers, but every time I think about it, I think better of it. And just for context, this happened when I was about nine years old, and I'm 18 now. My mom recently married and moved to California, so I was dragged along with her, leaving everything and everybody I knew behind, except my sister. The house we moved into was decently big, having four bedrooms and two stories, and my new stepfather was actually a pretty nice guy. My sister and I got our own separate rooms, which was a plus, despite them being right next to each other. One thing that always haunted me until I was 16 years old was the dark, and I never really understood why. Just the thought that anything could come out of nowhere to jump at me always frightened me, I guess. Anyway, it was a night in April, and my sister had just recently turned 12 years old. We were having a great time on the trampoline that my sister had gotten for her birthday, but since it was getting late, my mom came out and told me it was time for bed. I didn't argue with her, and I went straight to bed. The next thing I remember is waking up with a numb arm in the middle of the night. This was extremely strange for me. I always remember sleeping through the night as a kid, but this one night, I woke up for no explained reason. I didn't have the urge to go to the bathroom, I didn't need food or water, nothing that I can think of. But when I woke up, the first thing that I realized was that it was very cold in my room. Like, really cold for spring in California, and certainly nothing that an air conditioner could produce. I then picked my head up, looked around the room, and I saw this large black figure standing by my door. Being nine years old, I didn't know what to do, so I just pulled the blankets over my head and prayed for whatever this thing was to go away. About five minutes had passed, and I peeked out from under the covers to see the black figure staring at me. I froze, thinking that if I didn't move, then it wouldn't come to hurt me. But after a couple of minutes passed, I finally got the courage to jump out of bed and run across my room into this black figure. When I got to it, it suddenly disappeared, and when I turned the lights on, I couldn't find any traces of something having been there. Obviously still being frightened, I thought that being with my sister would help me calm down. So I rushed out of my room and burst through my sister's door to see the same black figure. I grew wide-eyed again and swiftly climbed into my sister's bed to find her 
gone. My sister wasn't in her room, and I was stuck alone on the bottom floor of my house, not knowing where my sister was, with this black thing stalking me. I started to cry, thinking that this black thing had killed my sister and was now going to kill me, but I somehow fell asleep. I was up the next morning to my sister shaking me, wondering what I was doing in her bed instead of my own. I told her that there was this black figure in my room, and I figured that going to her would make it go away. What she then told me shakes me up to this very day. She told me that she also saw a black figure in the middle of the night, and had gotten so scared that she ran all the way up to my parents' bedroom to sleep with them. The Melody of Crater Lake by Jordan L. My encounter during a camping trip near Crater Lake in Oregon still puzzles me. Crater Lake, known for its deep blue water and legends, seemed like the perfect spot for a solo camping adventure. I was looking for peace and quiet, but what I found was mystery. I set up camp in a secluded spot with a view of the lake. The first day was blissful. I hiked around the area, taking in the stunning scenery. As night fell, I sat by my campfire, the stars reflecting off the lake's surface, creating an almost otherworldly atmosphere. That's when I first heard it, a soft, haunting melody drifting across the lake. It sounded like a flute, but sweeter, more ethereal. I looked around, trying to find the source, but there was no one in sight. The music seemed to be coming from the lake itself. Intrigued and a bit unnerved, I decided to investigate. I walked along the shore, the melody growing louder, more compelling. It was as if the music was calling to me, pulling me toward a hidden secret of the lake. As I reached a clearing by the water's edge, the music suddenly stopped. The silence was abrupt, almost jarring. I stood there, confused, looking out over the calm waters. There was a ripple, as if something had just submerged, but other than that, nothing. I returned to my campsite, my mind racing with questions. I barely slept, the memory of the melody replaying in my mind. The next morning, I asked a park ranger about it. He smiled and said that others had reported hearing strange music around the lake, usually at night. Some believed it was the wind, others thought it was something more mystical, but nobody ever thought it was threatening, and neither did I. The rest of my trip was uneventful, but the melody lingered. On my last night, I heard it again. This time, I just listened, letting the mysterious music wash over me. It almost felt like a farewell, a closing serenade from the depths of Crater Lake. My camping trip there was over, and sadly I had to leave. And as unsettling and sometimes mysterious as I find the whole thing, I'm also really looking forward to going back. Like I said, it didn't strike me as being threatening, just odd. And who couldn't use a little touch of whimsy from time to time? This happened in Costa Mesa, California. I was homeless at the time and under immense stress as a result. I've had a dozen or so very strange things happen in my life, but this one was truly upsetting. I was walking my usual route, which was around the campus of the community college that I attended, even still. I had only recently quit my job and moved out of a house I was renting a room in. Admittedly, I am something of an antisocial, misanthropic, generally depressed person that feels the weight of the world seemingly heavier than my peers. But I'm an A student, and I think a troubled life has lent a heavy hand in these detrimental character traits. I'm being verbose only because I think, or hope, there's a certain genuine nature 
to someone who can see potential red flags in their own recollections. But I would swear to my creator that the following testimony is 100% accurate. So, I was walking and approaching a crosswalk. Down the adjacent sidewalk, I see a woman, 30 yards away, walking up to a grocery bag on the sidewalk, 10 feet in front of her. She's already carrying two in her hands, one in each. I go to help her, as I have nothing to do, and she seemed old. As I approached her, this was confirmed. At most, she stood five feet, probably two to three inches shorter. She looked to be about 60 to 70 years old. She was generally unkempt. I asked her if she could use some help. She said with a heavy accent, sure, and indicated her destination was on the other side of the street, where I had planned on crossing anyway. I was handed one of her bags and insisted on taking the other, leaving just the one that she'd been walking up on, now at our feet. We start heading to the corner, the bags were heavy enough for me to look inside. It looked to be four mangoes in each bag, but I remember thinking it was easily ten pounds. We get to the crosswalk and she starts hitting the button super fast, like her feet were on fire. At this point, the bags felt as if they had doubled in weight. We get to the signal and I make it no more than halfway through the intersection, and the bags feel every bit of eighty to a hundred pounds each. I'm 6'1", and I'm in good shape. I could not believe what was happening. I sincerely didn't think I was going to make it. I looked back at her, and she has both hands supporting her bag, taking half strides. She puts on the most disturbing, full tooth smile, and said, Too heavy? I remember the fear of her face made me turn around more than anything. I made it in one single step to the other side of the street, and I had to drop the bags. I remember the strangest of all was that the plastic handles hadn't been compromised whatsoever. No stretching, nothing. She was click-clacking in half steps, and at this point I was tearing up because I couldn't understand what was happening. She dropped her bag by my two. She looked at me, smiled wide, full teeth again, and said, Too heavy? You stop or keep going. I said, weeping, I'm so sorry. I can't go any farther. Her smile somehow got even bigger, and she said, Okay. I began to sprint back across the street to get away from her. I was ashamed and terrified. I looked back to where she was, and she was now hoisting each bag, one by one, under her chin with both hands walking it three or four steps, putting it down and then grabbing the next, carrying it three or four steps, over and over. She was walking into a place for the developmentally disabled. It was a community for mentally disabled people in the area. I walked away, weeping as I saw her carry those three bags, now no more than four feet at a time, but I also had no desire to help her anymore. I'm still bewildered and terrified. I don't know what else to add. I know it sounds made up or phony, or like I'm making up for being a terrible person, but I'm telling you, those bags went from holding just a few mangoes each to feeling like they were holding so much more. I don't know how that happened, and it's almost like she knew somehow. I don't know what happened that day, but it did, and if anybody knows how to explain it, please let me know. I've lived in California my whole life. As soon as I had my driver's license, I would save as much as I could so that I could go down to Disneyland at least once a year. It was a lot cheaper to do that back then, and I'm a Disney freak. When this happened, I was almost 22, and I was still living in my first apartment. It was in the South Bay area of the Silicon Valley. Earlier in the day, I had driven into the North Central Valley to pick up my best friend at the time. We were going to Disneyland, and this was her first time. 
She was so ridiculously excited, I didn't even mind the fact that I had to drive three hours north just to go back down south again once I had her in tow. We were finally officially on our way at about 9 p.m. so that we could avoid any traffic. We were going to make a quick stop by Isla Vista, where my partner was staying for school, to catch a nap and pack him up so we could all go together. I always took Highway 101 when I was driving down to Santa Barbara. It took longer than taking the I-5, but honestly, I just preferred it. This trip was no exception. A few hours into the trip, as my friend and I were blasting Disney music to get us in the mood and singing along, we had passed through King City. And that's when I began to see the strange shapes along the side of the road. I didn't think much of it at the time, attributing it to the Tully fog beginning to settle in onto the highway. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, there was a deer carcass right in front of us on the highway. Without enough time to avoid it, and going probably a little bit too fast, we ran right over the thing. Instantly, my car began to reek of decay. Honestly, it was horrific. We pulled over under the nearest street lamp to make sure that there was no damage to my car. We called animal control to report the corpse and pull the putrid deer meat out of my front bumper and grill. Soon enough, and only a little nauseous, we were back on our way. I remember that I had started to feel off right about then, but I thought it was just me being sick from the deer smell. At the time, I didn't even entertain how strange it was that there was a rotten deer carcass in the middle of a busy highway. They're usually prompt about at least moving those things to the side of the road where nobody will hit it. About 20 minutes later, the strange white shapes moving, almost rolling, along the side of the road became much more prevalent. There were zero traces of any fog, and with the smell almost completely gone, the sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach was only getting worse. I knew something was off, but I didn't want to say anything about it because my friend was a little bit of a scaredy cat. Then I saw what looked like a body, wrapped in gauze, roll onto the shoulder from an embankment. But when I looked for it again in the rearview mirror, there was nothing there. I had slowed down considerably at this point, which tipped my friend off that something was wrong. I could feel her nerves rising almost instantly. When I finally pulled my eyes back to the road in front of me, that's when I saw it. And my friend saw it too. On the side of the road, a man was standing beneath one of the sparsely placed street lamps. He was no ordinary man either. He was half as tall as a lamp, making him at least three meters tall. The not-actually-a-man man was wholly unclothed, but lacked any genitalia at all. Almost like an alien. Despite this, I more or less just understood that he was male. He was emaciated to the point of almost being skeletal, but still managed to be standing perfectly straight. His hair was long, wispy, like cobwebs, and his skin looked like white, tanned leather stretched over his bones. As we passed him, the only part of him that moved was his head, to slowly turn and keep watching us. His eyes almost looked like they were made of chrome metal. I kept my eye on him through the rearview mirror, watching him get farther and farther away, until we crested over the hill and were no longer able to see him. In the passenger seat beside me, my friend was sobbing uncontrollably, which to me meant that she had seen him too. Not wanting to stop, all I could do was offer her my hand and floor it. I tried to get to my partner's house as fast as I could. We spent several minutes not saying a word. I wanted to say something, but trying to wrap my brain around what I had just seen left me speechless. At some point, the radio had been switched off, leaving the only sound in the car being my friend sobbing. What happened next all happened more or less in the same moment. Without even a shudder, my friend abruptly stopped crying and almost threw herself at the window control on her door with one hand, frantically trying to buckle her seatbelt with the other. Her belt had been on the whole ride and she was particular about seatbelt safety. Before she could even reach it, the window was already halfway down, and she was scrambling to keep it from lowering any further. She screamed something about not letting it take her, and eventually got the window to roll back up. At the moment I saw her begin to move, I could hear the window was already going down. 
My hands were nowhere near the window controls on my side of the car. They both had been white-knuckled on the steering wheel since we saw the man, except for when I held her hand. At the moment I heard the window going down, I heard a raspy, biting whisper in my ear that said, I'm going to pull your friend out of that effing window. After hearing the voice, I slammed on my brakes and swerved onto the shoulder. By the time we stopped, the window was up and my friend was sitting back, shock white and wide-eyed in her seat. I was livid. I turned to the seemingly empty back seat, and almost in a growl, I spat out the words, Get the F out of my car. You are not welcome here. I never thought that anything would answer me back, but at that moment both my friend and I heard it, the same voice that it had whispered in my ear, saying, Fine. That was all it said, before I could feel that something had changed. I floored it again, calling my partner as my friend began to sob once more. I instructed him to do some warding things in his room before hanging up, and desperately tried to build a protective bubble around the car. We still had an hour or so to go before we reached Isla Vista, and honestly, it was one of the longest hours of my life. Eventually, my friend became more lucid, and we talked about what had happened to her. She told me that she didn't know why, but all of a sudden her seatbelt unbuckled, and she just knew something was going to try and pull her out of the window. I told her what I had heard and confirmed that we both heard the response to my demand. We eventually made it to Isla Vista, and decided to pack up with my partner and continue straight down to Orange County. Nothing else happened on the trip down, and we eventually got back to feeling the excitement for Disneyland. We all had an absolute blast, almost completely pushing what happened from our minds. Almost. We took the same route back home as well, and we didn't see a single thing out of place. I've made that drive probably a hundred times between Disney and visiting friends and partners in Southern California, and to this day, that's the one and only experience I've ever had on that drive. This is my story of a dude I happened to come across in the deep woods in Florida. This was in Ocala National Forest. I probably came across either a poacher's camp or a drug operation, and they put signs up to scare people away. In any case, my friend and I were hunting and stayed out past midnight looking for hogs. We realized we were way deeper into the woods than we had planned on being, and we began to walk out. We were probably three or four miles into the woods, off the main road. We were walking in the dark, heavily armed with AR-15s, sidearms, and fixed blade hunting knives in a hip sheath. So we really weren't afraid of anything. Plus, the moon was bright enough to navigate by, even under the trees. We had lights mounted on our rifles, and I had a large, powerful flashlight in my hand that I could make into a strobe or use as a club. The point is, we weren't paranoid of anything. We felt very prepared. We were heading back and we started to hear something hauling through the woods on our right. It was about to cross the trail in front of us. Most trails are old logging roads. They're pretty wide and they make square quadrants out of the forest. This particular trail cut across one of the quadrants and was overgrown and thin. We thought it was a deer or maybe a black bear. Either way, we couldn't shoot it at night. So instead of using the rifle lights, I used my handheld light. We waited until we heard it get near the trail, and then I turned my light on. All we saw was a pair of white legs cross the thin trail about 50 feet in front of us. They looked human. We were a little baffled, like what moron goes crashing through the deep woods at 1 a.m. in shorts and through the thick brush, not the trail. Super weird. But again, and armed as we were for hogs, we pushed on because it would have taken like 30 minutes extra to turn back and go around the quadrant. We hear crashing now and then in the woods, but it never got close to us again. Finally, we reached my car, and I was relieved that it was still there and not broken into, 
We keep the rifles loaded, shove our handguns between the seat and the center console, and get into the front seat. I begin to drive out of the forest with my moonroof open, and the stars were just gorgeous. It's easy to forget how amazing the night sky is in the middle of Ocala. About half a mile down the road, my headlights fall onto a man in a checkered button-down shirt and shorts, just walking along the road. We're miles from any paved road, and then it's another five to 10 miles on the paved road to get to a town. Also, this is in the northern part of the forest, where there are no old cabins that were built before it was declared a national park. This dude had no backpack or anything. Was this what we saw across the path? If so, what was he doing walking out here at 1.30 to 2 in the morning with no supplies, no flashlight, nothing? He didn't even look at us as we passed. Anyway, as we got near the paved road, we unloaded the rifles and put them in the trunk and went home. It was a really fun trip, and I can't wait to go back, but I will always be armed in Ocala. Something seriously weird is going on out there. I managed a resort in the Adirondack for several years. The place is old and rustic. It's miles from civilization and very peaceful. It was built in the 20s and had somewhat of a sordid past. It was built for a Canadian senator who would run rum down from Canada during the Prohibition. We still had the underground locked safe room where he would store the booze, as well as hidden booze hiding areas underneath some of the cabins. Calvin Coolidge stayed at a camp across the pond during his presidency and would visit my camp, for the spirits, I'm sure. Anyway, I met a girl and decided to sleep out under the stars on the camp's peninsula. It started to rain, so I suggested we sleep on the screened-in porch of the boathouse, which I thought was a pretty good compromise. So, after we were all set up, it was getting pretty late, about 1.30 in the morning or so, we were laying there, and I was all tossing and turning because I'd been asleep and woken up. So I have a hard time falling asleep after stuff like that. We'd been laying there for about a half an hour or so, when I hear the bathroom door open in the boathouse. It couldn't have been anything else but that door. I did all the maintenance on those old buildings, and oiling that particular door was on my work list for the next day. I knew exactly what it sounded like. My first thought was that it was my boss, the owner of the camp. She is notoriously nosy and has been known to spy on the staff in their staff quarters. So she was my first logical thought as to who had made the noise. Why she would have been hiding out in the men's bathroom in the boathouse for over an hour is beyond my comprehension. I proceed to hear footsteps walking across the boathouse, down the three steps, onto the dance floor, and stopping right in front of the door to the screened-in porch. I lay there, just waiting for the door to open and for my boss to call my name. As the minutes stretched out, I started praying that she would open the door, walk away, sneeze, dance the funky chicken, anything but there was nothing. The rest of the night I stayed up, stiff straight in my sleeping bag. No receding footsteps, no door noises, no nothing. Just my girlfriend, myself, the night, and an empty boathouse. The next morning, my girlfriend, she wasn't at the time, but she was the four years that followed, rolled over to me and immediately asked me about the footsteps the night before. She had also stayed up all night, waiting for some other sound to explain those footsteps in the night, and heard nothing. She was terrified. We never went into that boathouse again. I unfortunately had to go to the boathouse myself on a daily basis. Everything was cool during the day. At night, I had to turn all the lights in the camp off. 
This is something I've done every night for the past three years. However, ever since that, there was always a sense of dread going in there, being alone in the dark in the boathouse. The worst part is that there's this enormous hanging bed in there in front of the fireplace. It was for the former camp owners to take naps on during the day, hung on chains, so that the bed could be lifted out of the way for entertaining guests in the evening. Every single night, that bed was swinging. A 175 pound bed swinging on its chains in the darkness of the boathouse. Until my last day at that camp, if I went in at night, that bed was swinging. This paranormal encounter took place at the hotel that I worked at last year. I was 20 years old, working at a small mom and pop hotel in Ontario, California. I had worked there for some time before I started to stay there for a few months. The owner taught me everything I needed to know so that I could run his business while he went on a business trip to Africa. Mind you, I didn't have a car so my only option was to stay there and work around the clock if need be. I didn't have to pay for the room, and I got to wash my clothes in the laundry room. There was a grocery store within walking distance and restaurants all around me where I could get food at a discounted price since I worked at the hotel. I thought this was a pretty sweet deal. One night my boyfriend came down to visit and while he was in the bathroom, I heard banging coming from the room next to ours. Then I heard scratching on my walls. I told him to stop playing around and he didn't even know what I was talking about. The banging continued all night, so I called the front desk and I told them that the people next to me were being loud. I had to be up at six to go down there and work. She was quiet for a while and then she said, we didn't rent out the room next to yours. Mind you, I had an end room. I quickly ran outside to see if the curtains were open or closed, and they were open. I could see right into that room, and nobody was in there. It was an outside hotel. I've never been so creeped out in all my life. Then I decided to sage the room just to rid it of any bad spirits or energy, and that worked, for a while, until it didn't. The next time something demonic happened, I was asleep and kept hearing whispers in my sleep. I hate whispers with a passion, they creep me out to the fullest. So I sat up in bed, and I was looking around the dark room. In the corner of the room, I saw white, glowing eyes staring at me. I felt frozen by its glare. I could see its body, and saw that it was crouched down, holding its knees. Then I saw more shadows appearing closer and closer. I reached to turn on the lamp next to the bed, and it didn't turn on. My next thought was that I needed to run outside and get to safety. It took all the balls in the world for me to get up and run out there. I was so scared I couldn't even feel my legs. All I could feel was the cold wooden floor beneath me. I got to the door and flung it open only to see that the bedroom curtains were on the outside of my room's window. The sky was black and the clouds were dark, dark green with gray tints. I was mortified to realize that I was still asleep and I hadn't actually woken up. I looked back inside the hotel room and I saw myself asleep in the bed. I screamed bloody murder and that's when I jolted awake for real. I said a prayer and went back to sleep. The encounter that followed was much worse. I went back to sleep and yet again I could hear things. I was scared and I couldn't move any part of my body. I started to pray in my head as loud as I could, only to awake and feel my body slam onto the bed as if I had been levitating. I called my grandma the next day and she said that it was probably a demonic attack. I got my car shortly after, just a few days later and I never stayed in that hotel again. I was severely depressed at the time I was staying there, and maybe those spirits were feeding off of that, but I never stayed there again.
When I was in northern Nova Scotia this last year while camping and fishing, I saw these odd shadow figures in the treetops. Everything was proportional about them, except for their arms. They were just way too long. They appeared just after dusk and they never came near to the ground. They didn't necessarily feel malicious. It just felt bad. Like I shouldn't do anything that could draw their attention or else it would have gone badly. Nothing of note happened other than them being there, but I'd never heard of anything like it before. Is anyone aware of any legends or anything describing shadow figures and treetops? I'd love to even have a name for these things, because to this day, I still have no idea what I saw. The night I can't explain. I've got a story that I just need to share with someone, and I think maybe this is the right place. This happened last summer, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So I'm an avid camper. I love the outdoors, the whole nine yards. Last July, I decided to go solo camping in this pretty remote area that I'd been to a few times before. It's peaceful, off the beaten path, and you rarely run into anyone else. Perfect for a little solitude, right? I set up camp, had a small fire going, and everything was just as usual. Beautiful night, clear skies, the sound of the wilderness around me. I eventually dozed off. But then things started to get weird. I woke up, I'm guessing around 2 a.m., and there was this strange feeling in the air like electricity almost. I stepped out of my tent to get some fresh air, thinking I was just being paranoid. But then I saw it. Across the small clearing, there was this faint bluish light hovering just above the ground. It wasn't like any flashlight or camp light. It was different. It kind of pulsed softly, moving slightly. I rubbed my eyes thinking I was dreaming, but it was still there when I looked again. I felt this weird mix of fear and curiosity. I couldn't move closer though. My body just wouldn't let me. So I just stood there, watching this light dance around for what felt like hours, but must have been just a few minutes. And then just as suddenly as it appeared, it vanished. Just poof, gone. No sound, no trace, nothing. The normal night sounds came back, and that electric feeling in the air disappeared. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night, just sat by the extinguished fire trying to process what I'd seen. In the morning, I checked around, thinking I would find some kind of logical explanation, but there was nothing. No burn marks, no footprints, nothing out of the ordinary at all. I've told a few close friends and they suggested everything from ball lightning to sleep paralysis, but I was fully awake and it didn't feel like any natural phenomenon I know of. Has anyone else experienced anything like this while camping? Or am I just losing it? So when I was like 13, my mom and her boyfriend had to go to the hospital and nobody would be able to get my brother to the bus stop the next morning because they had to stay overnight. So I got to miss school the next day to take my brother. After I made sure my brother got on the bus and all that, I went home and cleaned and did random stuff that a 13 year old would do. It was around 1145 when there was a knock on my door Thinking it was the mailman or a neighbor or something like that, I opened the door and said hello. There was this kid at my door. He couldn't have been much older than me at the time, but he had bangs that were covering his eyes, which I found weird because it was like 107 degrees out. This kid was super still. I thought one of my friends put a mannequin there or 
something like that. But then it spoke. It sounded like a robot or something, like it was programmed to say what it was saying. My mother said to ask someone for a phone in fear that I get lost. Do you have a phone? He said, like some freaking 1950s kid. At this point, I was absolutely crapping my pants because one, I'm a 13 year old girl and this older boy dressed like a burglar was at my door with his half face covered. Two, for some reason, I just couldn't look away. I felt like if I moved or said anything other than yes, I'd explode. And three, I saw two other boys around the same age standing in my driveway, dressed the exact same way that the one in front of me was. Baggy jeans, dark hoodie, and scuffed up vans. So I started to stutter and shake my head. It was the only thing I could do. I finally got out a no, then started to close my door. But this guy put his foot in the way. Then the other two started to walk up, and I was like, hell no. I grabbed the bat by the door and threatened him. If you don't leave right now, I'll kick your effing ass, and then I'll call the cops. I shouted loudly enough so that at least one of my neighbors could hear, I hope. Now, I was this short girl with SpongeBob pajama pants on. I was in no way threatening. He moved his foot and stepped back into the middle of the other two perfectly, like it was choreographed. Then the far right one said in the exact same tone and voice as the first, I'm sorry to bother you. I'll just come again later and ask. Internally, I was planning my funeral. Just as I was about to close the door, the first one smiled, looked up, and his eyes were completely black. The other two looked and did the same thing, and they were exactly the same. I was like, nope, and slammed the door shut and called my neighbor, who was this big ass 20 something year old dude. He ran over and looked for them all around my house, but he said they were gone. When I told my mom all of this, she didn't believe me and told her that I was clearly lying. Said me, the girl with absolutely no social life and is afraid of her own shadow, was lying. Well, I wasn't lying and it definitely happened. And it was terrifying. I thought I'd share one of my Bigfoot experiences. I grew up in Oregon. As most Oregonians do, we did a lot of camping. One particular trip we were at was at our favorite site on the east side of Hills Creek Reservoir. I don't remember the date exactly, but I was probably 14 to 15 years old, around 1999. My tent was fairly close to the water, maybe 40 feet back while my parents' tent with my younger siblings was about 200 feet farther back into the woods. I was maybe 15 feet from the fire, and our kitchen was set up about 30 feet west of me on a raised area. Everyone went to bed while I stayed up around an hour longer with my dog. We eventually went to bed. I get all cozy and my dog perks up with alert. I wasn't too worried, as I could hear frogs and crickets. And then... Everything went dead silent. The frogs and crickets stopped. I could hear something coming through the woods from the direction of the lake. It sounded large. I thought maybe a bear or a deer. My dog starts growling, and I do my very best to keep her quiet. The walking sound gets to the raised area of the camp, where our kitchen is. I hear some of the stuff move around. I manage to slowly unzip part of the tent window. It's very dark, not much of a moon, and the fire was dying. But I could vaguely see something. Then, a very large figure steps down from the raised area, about a four to five foot drop, and walks directly toward my tent. My heart is pounding. The dog starts shaking and growling. Thankfully, no bark is released. The figure moves past my tent within five to six feet and makes its way back to the road and back through the woods. It took huge, broad steps, 
each with a deep thump. Ten minutes later, the frogs and crickets came back. I hope to gain some insight, advice, or help about what happened two weeks ago. I'm a little bit familiar with the black-eyed children phenomenon, but I need some help to identify what exactly happened to help two family members who haven't been right since the sighting. In 2013, I moved with my family into a foreclosed six-bedroom home on 14 acres, straight up in the middle of nowhere in the Poconos. My father and I noticed very weird things going on the second we moved in, but my mother and sister seemed not to notice. Everyone other than my dad and I and my entire family are the, oh it was the wind type of people. I won't go into everything that happened there as it would fall under a different category, but there is some evidence that the entire area of where this house is located is haunted. Now, historically speaking, with actual evidence, people settled here around the old mill area long ago and brutally killed many Iroquois Indians. This area is very spread out over miles of heavily wooded mountains. Two weeks ago, my uncle on my mother's side and his girlfriend came to visit my parents' home. They do this quite often, as my parents always have people over for beer, games, bonfires, and things like that. I just wanted to start off by saying my uncle is a non-believer, a Harley rider who, to this day, I have never seen really get scared of anything or anyone before this. My uncle and his girlfriend are playing foosball with my parents when they realize that it's 12.30 in the morning, so they decide to head home. They take all the back roads, and once they turn onto Running Valley Road, about six minutes from the house, my uncle's girlfriend sees two figures. They were pretty far away at this point, but it was two small figures waiting to cross the road. Just to mention, there was nothing out there. No houses besides one abandoned one that was still two miles up the road. Nothing else. The only thing in the vicinity is a cave. These figures were attempting to cross the road to go into the woods, which was very odd because of the time and location. They are now approaching these figures. Headlights start to shine directly on them. Both my uncle and his girlfriend see two young girls aged about 9 to 11 years old. One is much bigger than the other, wearing what my uncle best describes as early 1900s church clothing, like dresses to the knee with white cotton shawls and cropped sweaters. Weird, right? I mean, what the heck are two 10-year-old girls doing out at 12.30 a.m. in the middle of nowhere wearing church clothing? They also noticed that the bigger child had her arms wrapped around the smaller one, like you would do if she was hurt or scared or cold. At this point, my uncle's girlfriend is like, it's children, we have to stop and help. Now at this point, the truck is almost right next to the little girls. Both had their heads held down. So then, the bigger of the two starts to pick her head up to look at the passing vehicle. Then both my uncle and his girlfriend notice that the girl has no eyes, just black holes, as if they'd been carved straight out of her face. The girlfriend says, What the F was that? You saw that, right? Tur turn around, go back right now. My uncle, scared shitless, takes off, flying to get home. They get home and get into an argument because she wants to drive back and see what was up. She grabs her own car keys and my uncle basically was like, you are not going back there. We are never going on that road again. He calls my parents in an extreme panic, tells them, and then they start bugging because they know that he would never lie or be that freaked out if it wasn't warranted. So my mom starts to tell me everything. Mind you, my family knows nothing of black-eyed kids and had never heard of it before. I send my mom an article to forward to my uncle with some of the very basic info. Young kids, no or black eyes, dreadful feeling, sometimes outdated clothing, things like that. Now my whole family is bugging out. I don't know what you guys think. Let me know if you have ever experienced something similar 
or if you think they encountered something else altogether. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska and her dad had lived there for quite a while, so they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow, and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyway, we played in the meadow and the stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. I can't explain it. I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad picked up his fishing gear, and we all walked back to the truck on this long, winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced that my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six-cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four-wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open, with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction but didn't see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was, seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods, to deer, to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent, and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke sometime in the middle of the night to hear something, or someone, walking outside. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs, because it had a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was, it sounded big. I could hear its weight, if that makes any sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet, but deep, heavy breathing at times. As I lay there listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite, and then back to our tent almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long. It felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened 
until somehow I eventually fell asleep. The next morning I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft, and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, lingers in the back of my mind whenever I camp. I will always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. Today is February 11th of 2020, and I have just had an encounter less than an hour ago. So I'm hanging with my friend. We're going up on top of a mountain, just to go up there. We had no real reason to go up there, we just wanted to. So we get up there and turn the car off. It's completely dead silent. It's really foggy from all the rain that we've been getting, and it just seems to put me and my friend on edge. So we're sitting there with our windows cracked because we were vaping, and all of a sudden, we hear something in the woods, off to our left. He turns down the music, and we both listen. We can see and hear the bushes rustling. First it would be in one spot, and then ten seconds later it would be in another. My friend opens the door and I grab his wrist and pull him back into the car. I ask him if he's crazy, and he tells me no. He's just curious. I tell him that being curious is what gets people killed in horror movies and I'll be damned if I let you die with me present. He looks at me, disappointed, and then gets back in the car and closes the door. We continue to sit there and listen. We hear the same stuff for about two minutes. And then, it suddenly stops. We both look around and he starts hitting my shoulder with a sense of panic. I go, what do you want? He points to a gravel driveway that leads up to the power lines we were parked under. At the top of the hill, we both see a tall figure standing there, staring us down. I could see the faint red glow in its eyes. I could see my friend's chest rising and falling in the faint light that our phones were emitting. I felt fine, but I could definitely tell that my friend was not. It wasn't until the figure starts walking toward us with an alarming speed that I scream at my friend to snap out of it. He starts the car and hauls ass down the mountain. When we got off the mountain, we both looked at each other, asking each other non-verbally what the heck we just saw. I knew what I saw. I know it was Bigfoot. My friend wasn't so sure. He's not a believer. But after tonight, I feel like our believer community has grown by one. I have spent decades in the military intelligence community, so I don't want to put too much information out there about myself on a public forum. However, I am curious if there are any other experiences that overlap my own. We lived off base in this rundown community that looks like any other rundown community you would find next to a military installation. The apartment complex itself was nice by the standards of the rest of the buildings in our area. At about 12.30 in the morning, on a Friday morning, I was woken up by a series of knocks on my heavy wooden door. I have a rule. One series of knocks is just people messing with the neighbors, but if they really need something, they'll knock twice. Yep, there came the second series of knocks. I expected it to be someone from work trying to get a hold of me. My cell phone had died. It had happened before. I opened the door and stared down at this kid that I estimate to have been somewhere around six years old. There was so much about this kid that was just bizarre. The eyes feature suggested in BEKs seems kind of trivial. I can't say with 100% confidence that his eyes were all black. I just don't know, because the rest of him was such a mess. 
When I look at people I don't know, I have a habit of avoiding eye contact. The rest of his description is as follows. His clothing was a gray, filthy hooded sweatshirt with the hood up halfway with matching sweatpants. The shoes were unremarkable. The skin complexion, for lack of a better phrase, was extremely pale. I don't know if there were blemishes in the way of freckles or scars on the skin, or if he was just really dirty, but there were some marks. His hair was possibly reddish brown, messy, dirty, and short. His face was in this grimace of hatred. His expression was like somebody who was sucking on the world's most sour candies. And here's the worst part of it. The body odor he was radiating was like something I have never smelled before or since. I've smelled decomposing bodies in war. The closest smell that I can relate to was in ranger school. In ranger school, due to the lack of food and rest, often the guy's bodies would start to consume muscle for energy. Combined with the lack of bathing opportunities, this creates an odor that is hard to top. But this kid's smelled like weaponized foulness. I asked, can I help you? In a flat voice, void of inflection, he said, my parents don't like you. I responded, uh, what? He stated, you'll be okay if you give us something great. I slammed the door on him because I thought he was just screwing with me. He let out this, no. I could hear him on the other side throwing a tantrum, like you see toddlers in the store doing when their parents won't let them have something. Definitely a very strange thing to do at midnight. However, kids running around the dilapidated neighborhood unsupervised was a pretty common occurrence. I just chalked it up to bad parenting. I showered and threw my clothes out because I didn't want that stench on me, and I went back to bed because I had to be up again in four hours. Strangely, the stench didn't seem to linger. It's like it went with him. I saw this kid on three other occasions. The second time, I was going out to my car in the morning, and he was standing in the parking lot glaring at me. When I came home, he was staring at me, standing in the same spot. Then when I looked out the window hours later, he was still in the same spot, glaring with that same sneer at nothing. I asked my wife what she made of him, and she said he wasn't bothering anything, which was a pretty low bar for that neighborhood. Kids would often run around vandalizing people's vehicles and apartments. I thought about calling the authorities, but what was I going to say? There's this weird kid. He might need help because he's weird. Oh, and he stinks. The truth is, I hated this kid. Now, I have three kids of my own, so I don't just out and out hate other kids, but I hated this one. I hated his smell. I hated that he existed. I felt like he was trying to target and bully me for some reason. No, I didn't want to help this kid. Also, I had these paranoid thoughts of, if this kid hates me as much as I hate him, he's going to lie to the cops and tell them I had harmed him. It could affect my security clearance. It's best to just ignore him and this will all go away. One time, I saw him interacting with kids outside, so I knew he wasn't just a figment of my imagination. However, he didn't play with them like a typical kid would. This girl would come up and grab him by the arm, and he would just stand there and glare at her. There were kids running around him, and he just stared at them with that grimace, unmoving. My wife wanted me to share this experience that I had back in 2011. At the time, I worked in the office of a regional command. I've read into various truly bizarre government programs. However, thinking about it, I still don't know what to make of this kid. I don't know what to get out of writing this. Maybe someone knows more about this kid or has had other similar experiences. It's certainly not extraordinary, like some of the other experiences that people on Reddit have had. I'm not saying this kid was magical or demonic, I don't know. I can't rule out that he was truly just some kind of unfortunate kid. Maybe the right thing to do would have been to get him help. However, I just can't get past the hatred that I had for him, for no reason. Between that and the smell, my experience wasn't that bizarre otherwise. What I do know 
is that I'm fine with never seeing that kid again. Maybe these BEK experiences can be explained by kids just being extra weird. But either way, I'm glad my experience is over. A few months back, I was driving down a dirt road near where I live, out in the middle of nowhere, and my radio started going fuzzy and switched to a different song. Right about then, I see two kids, a boy and a girl, the ages I would guess would be at most eight years old, sitting down and playing on the side of the road, not near any houses, which is very strange considering how dangerous it is for kids to be alone on these roads. I see people going way faster than the speed limit all the time, so no responsible parent would let their kids play like this. I was concerned about their safety, so I pulled up beside them and asked if their parents knew they were out here. Without even looking up at me, they just said, yes. I said, okay, well, be careful out here and watch for cars, and I drove off. I didn't see their eyes as they kept their heads down. And our conversation was not long, but something seemed off about the whole thing. Around a month after that, I stumble upon r slash black eyed kid stories on Reddit. And before that, I had never heard of BEKs. It got me thinking, maybe these kids could have been related to that phenomenon. But I really can't say for sure since I never got a look at their faces. Here's where the story gets really spooky. I went to buy some weed. It's legal here, and I went to a dispensary that is also legal. And when I pulled up to the shop, a black SUV pulled up beside me. It was an older guy, maybe in his 50s, dressed in black. While waiting for my weed, this guy was on his phone, and I overheard him spell out my first and last name. Like, who is this guy, and how does he know who I am? So I get my weed, and as I'm leaving, I look at his license plate and it says, remember me. I was a little freaked out and too scared to confront this man. I didn't even bother looking at his face because I didn't know what the hell was going on. I mean, was my life in danger? Does he work for the government? Is he an alien? I don't know. One last thing, probably a coincidence, but when I got home, I played a random playlist on Spotify and guess what the first song that came on was called? Yep, remember me. I can't remember the artist. I really don't know what to believe, but since this has happened, my aunt died of a brain aneurysm and my mom has been diagnosed with cancer. I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but please pray for my family's safety. We could really use some positive vibes right now. I don't know if it's related to these kids and that guy, or maybe it's all just a coincidence, but either way, it's got me thinking. This happened to me when I was in high school, living with my parents. One night, I went out with friends. I drank a couple of beers and I went back home. I was just a little tipsy, not drunk, and I decided to take a shower before going to bed. It was about one to two in the morning. The shower cabin that we had wasn't fixed to the floor or the walls. It was like a capsule, but it was very heavy and hard to move. I entered the shower and after a few minutes, the cabin started swinging left to right and it was very loud. I was standing trying not to move and it stopped. But as soon as I continued to shower again, it started swinging again. I stepped outside and there was my dad banging on the bathroom door, asking what I was doing because the noise woke him up. I just got dressed and went to bed. The next morning, my dad asked me again what that noise was, and I tried to explain what happened. He said that I was just drunk and fell in the shower, so I moved the cabin. But that did not happen. I know that it didn't happen. I wasn't drunk. I had had maybe two beers. 
And I was standing the whole time. I had never fallen. It moved by itself, something that should have been impossible. I went to the bathroom and tried very hard to move or swing the cabin back and forth, but it was impossible. I still have no idea what happened that night. This happened a couple of years ago. My husband and I were up late, worrying about our dog. She had thrown up something red and we thought she wasn't feeling well. Turns out she had jumped on the dining room table and ate some of my roses in a vase, so she ended up being just fine. But the husband and I were worried and we hadn't realized that she had eaten the roses yet, so we decided to go to the vet. It was about 10 or 11, I'm pretty sure, at night. When we stepped outside the door, we looked to our left at the cul-de-sac that's next to the neighborhood. It's an empty road except for one house. An old man and his dog live there, and there's a CrossFit gym. In the middle of the cul-de-sac, there's this little girl, maybe four or five. She's riding this old metal tricycle in a circle. The tricycle was making this constant squeak, squeak sound. So that in and of itself was pretty creepy. There was just something off about it. The way she was riding the tricycle, it just didn't seem right. My husband and I both remember her being under some kind of light, but there's no street light where she was at. I felt creeped out, but more confused and worried than anything. I started to head toward her, but my husband pulled me away and said we gotta go. He was pretty freaked out by her. I didn't really get a good look at her eyes. When my husband pulled me away, the squeaking abruptly stopped, and I heard a little voice say, Mommy, I don't really remember everything else that well. Everything happened pretty fast. But I glanced back after she stopped pedaling, and as my husband was pulling me away, and there was just something weird about her face. I vaguely remember thinking that her eyes were black, but I didn't get a good look, and I didn't know about BEKs at the time, so I really didn't have a framework in which to process this. I just learned about BEKs recently. Does anyone else think that this might have been a BEK encounter? This happened to my wife and I after exiting a movie in Mexico City. That day, we were pretty broke. I just had money for the movies, but not for the parking. Here in Mexico, all the public parking costs. So we decided to park the car behind the shopping mall on a back alley. When we were out of the movie, the shopping mall access to the back alley was closed, so we had to walk our way up there. When we were about to arrive to the car, a small looking kid, around six to seven years old, pulled my shirt from behind, asking for some spare change. This is something pretty common in Mexico. There are beggars everywhere. I said, sorry kid, I'm broke. I have no spare change. The situation smelled fishy, so I opened the car with the remote key and made signs to my wife to enter the car fast. The kid asked again. The whole time he was looking to the floor, and it was a really dark alley, so I wasn't able to see his face clearly. I was using my phone flashlight to see around. That's when something makes my radar go crazy. I remember the hour. I see on my watch that it's 1.33 in the morning. In my city, no beggar kids are out at that time, especially on an alley like that, unless they're trying something sketchy, like to rob you or worse. Without looking back, I rushed inside the car and placed the locks on it. That's when, while viewing the rearview mirror, I saw him staring directly at us. His eyes were like a void, a deep, dark black that made all of my body enter this fight or flight stance, a smile so evil that it got my heart racing incredibly fast. 
He ran next to my door and knocked on the glass while staring directly at me, asking for money over and over again. He tried to open the door by pulling the handle restlessly, and as soon as he left the handle alone by a second, I turned on the car and made a run for our safety. This kid started running behind us, almost at the same speed of the car, while screaming at us. Finally, we reached a highly transited avenue and the kid was nowhere to be seen. Needless to say, my wife and I were scared shitless. From time to time, we drive by there at 1 to 3 in the morning, trying to find that kid again, but we've never seen him. Also, I would like to add that the public illumination service doesn't work on that alley. It was really hard to see the kid. I don't really know what to make of it, but it gives me nightmares up to this very day. I'm not sure exactly what I saw, but I'm not sure where else to go looking for information, so maybe you can help. Recently, I have moved into a new place. It's a duplex, and my grandmother lives next door on the other side. The actual house has good energy, and there's a massive beautiful backyard. Before this event, I had felt quite safe and comfortable, except for just getting used to the new noises around here. For context, I'm using the living room as a bedroom. The front door has a rectangle eye-level glass panel, but the glass is distorted. There's also a security screen, so there's a black steel X across the panel as well. Right across from the front door are two double glass doors into the living room, which is the bedroom now, which I keep open, and my bed is right through that. I know it's bad feng shui, but it's the only way the room works. So from my bed, I can see the glass panel and vice versa. There's an outdoor sensor light that turns on when it senses movement. The other day, my grandmother put up some pink wind chimes outside my door, and you could see them through the glass panel from my bed, albeit distorted. Around 11.30 p.m. or midnight, I was just about to go to sleep, and I turned the lights off, when suddenly, I saw the outdoor sensor light flick on. Through the glass panel, I swear I saw what at first looked like a woman, with pale like white skin, and really dark, exaggerated makeup, almost like drag makeup. She had black eyebrows and eyeliner that was heavily drawn out, and it looked like whoever it was had a pink hat on, but in retrospect, I think it was the wind chimes. I was unbelievably terrified. I quickly jumped out of the bed and out of sight of the panel and called my grandmother, trying to figure out who this could be. We spent 20 minutes on the phone whilst I turned on all the lights. The figure was gone when I started doing that. I turned the sensor light to always be on. I closed my double doors so that there was less of a view of the panel. When I finally got back into bed, I found out that the sensor light has two parts, one that can be turned permanently on, and one that comes on just with movement, right outside the door. I saw that light come on again, and I jumped out of sight before I could even look. My grandmother insists that it was probably an animal that triggered the sensor, or the wind chimes, but I never heard the wind chimes, and I don't think an animal could be large enough to set it off, or look like a woman wearing heavy makeup. Further, I cannot shake the image of that face out of my head. The only way I can describe the energy of it was that it was like the being, or whatever it was, was sizing me up. It was just staring, and it felt like it was deciding whether to try and come in and take me or not. I am fully aware that I sound crazy, but I cannot shake the feeling that there was some sort of energy there. Now, in the daytime, my cat has been going crazy, crying at all the doors and windows. He's never been like this before. It's really creeping me out. The actual house feels safe, and if there is some sort of energy out there, it feels like for some reason it can't get inside even if it wants to. I've taken down the wind chimes and put tinfoil over the glass, 
So basically, I just wanted people to hear me out and tell me what they think. If it could have been something normal, or if it was just the fear in my brain, turning the wind chimes and the distorted glass into some weird face, I'll take it. But I just can't get over the feeling I had. About six months ago or so in South Texas, I was visiting my family in a decently sized RV park in a run-down side of town. It was maybe 10 p.m. or so at the time and the dog had to go out. My dog only does his business at the end of the street in a buddy of mine's lawn and has issues passing due to a tumor in his back. So I always stop at the end of the street and kind of watch the stars and stuff and wait for him. Well, I looked down the street near the entrance to the park, and under this lonesome streetlight, I saw a silhouette of a child, maybe 9 to 12 years old, just standing there, almost in a T pose, but not quite. The odd thing I noticed was the hands, which were open enough where it was almost like a crab, like in the sense that you could see the thumb, etc., and the fingers had zero movement. I was puzzled trying to figure out how this figure was so dark under the streetlight, even though it was literally like seeing someone just enough to make out the outline in the darkness. I mean, zero light was reflected on this kid. Just utter darkness, like a void. The only thing I could think was that somebody was pulling a random prank and actually put a cutout or a mannequin even in the middle of the road. But again, I was still confused how it remained so pitch black directly under a light source that bright. I didn't walk up to it because of two reasons. One, being my dog, who was still trying to do his business. And second, I have a keen sense of picking up on negative energy. And it was the same vibe I felt in the haunted house I grew up in, where I also had several spiritual encounters. I sat there staring for more than a few minutes just focusing on fine points of this silhouette, looking for the slightest flinch of movement, but I never saw it. It was at this time I figured I would pull out my phone and try to zoom up on this figure, but oddly, the screen in my camera mode was pitch black, so I couldn't make anything out, and when I did zoom up to where I surely thought the figure should be, I saw nothing but the street light through the lens. A couple actually began to walk behind this kid around this time, and I noticed that they didn't even glance at or acknowledge this kid standing maybe six feet or less from them as they walked by. What was super weird was as they passed under the same streetlight, you could make out everything, from facial expressions down to what clothes they were wearing, but the kid remained solid black. They were walking their dog, and even the dog didn't seem to notice which is odd. I gave up and glanced down to put my phone in my pocket, and when I looked up, the figure was gone. It just vanished in that second or two of looking away. At this point, I was getting really confused and just wanted to get home. The creep factor was through the roof. I turned around and began to walk back when all of a sudden, fast-paced running was coming up behind me. Startled but trying to keep my composure, I quickly turned around and saw this gray blur just zoom past. The thing that stuck out the most was for sure the very gray skin and what I swear were black eyes from just the slight bit of eye contact that I had. It was a kid. Then right as this kid is passing by, he says, ha, I scared you. And boom, dude's gone just like that, poof. He was moving way too fast for any person. By the time I got home, I began researching what this area has as far as legends go, and I stumbled across BEKs. I guess Texas is very aware of BEKs and has had several sightings, starting from some dude in Abilene who was a reporter. It wasn't until I did some more research and talked to some other Redditors before I became totally convinced that this had to have been a BEK encounter.
My story isn't as scary as it is odd. This happened about 10 to 12 years ago, and I'm not sure if it was the real thing or not. When I was about 10 or 11, I went to the mall with my mom and we went into Sears. We were headed toward the main part of the mall and we passed by a lady. I remember that she had a baby stroller and two kids following her, one boy and one girl. They looked a few years younger than me. The boy probably eight and the girl looked about six. I distinctly remember those kids having fully black eyes and pale veiny skin. I kind of felt guilty looking at them because I thought they had a condition, so I looked away. I never forgot about those kids, and I would think about it from time to time. Until recently, I looked up their condition. I searched pictures, websites, and different keywords to try to find a disease or something. Nothing. Earlier today, it clicked that what I witnessed could have been paranormal. I had known about black-eyed children for a few years but I never put two and two together. This raised so many questions rather than answers for me. Why were they following her if they were BEKs? What happened to that lady? I wonder if what I saw is truly paranormal, but I don't think I really want that answer. This all happened when I was a kid. I was spending the weekend at my mom's house. My parents were separated, and I woke up one morning and watched some cartoons in her room while she slept. Eventually, I turned the TV off and went downstairs to make a bowl of cereal. I sat down at the table, which was about 10 feet from the open basement door. As I was eating, I heard my mom call me very loudly from the basement. The only things down there were a washing and drying machine and a toilet. I walked over to the door and peeked down there, and it was pitch black. That's when I remembered that my mom was asleep upstairs and hadn't come past me at all. So I freaked out, ran upstairs to her room, and sure enough, she was there asleep. There was no way that it could have been her, and it was just us in the house. The apartment gave me off, strange, and creepy vibes. My mom and I and a few other people all hated the feeling that you would get in the basement and the back room upstairs would give off very negative energy. Every time you went in there, you would start feeling kind of sad and very alert. She never used that room. It only had a couple of boxes in it for the five or so years that she lived there. Has anyone else had similar experiences? When I was 17, my brother, mom, grandma, and I lived in a centennial house. With it being over a hundred years old, I figured that there had to be a ghost or two. A lot of strange occurrences happened, and I always felt like I was being watched, especially in the basement. It was a basement with four different rooms. One door opened into a storage room to the left, and a sump pump room. My brother's room right across the hallway, and the other room next to his was the laundry room. One summer day, we had just gotten home from a camping trip. I was thirsty and a bit hungry, so I went into the kitchen to make me something to eat. Note that my kitchen has sliding glass doors to the outside, and just right to it another door leading to the basement. I was standing at the counter when I heard my brother call my name and ask if I wanted a smoke. I'm like, yeah, where are you? The sound came very clearly from the basement, but since there's a deck outside my glass door, I figured he could have been outside. I had dark curtains, and they weren't drawn. I walk up the basement door and yell down again, asking if he's down there. No answer. I'm like, okay, fine. He'll come find me if he wants to smoke. 
So I walked to the front of the house, through my grandma's living room, and into the other living room, and out to the front door to our van to grab my backpack and purse. As I go outside, my brother and his girlfriend at the time were unloading the van. I asked if they had called my name, and he was very confused. I told him what I had just heard, and the very short conversation we had just had. He and his girlfriend both assured me that they had been outside unloading our camping stuff in the garage, and hadn't been anywhere near me. It sent chills down my spine. I limited my time going downstairs from then on. I still don't know what it was. As I mentioned in the last story, my boyfriend and I live in the basement of his grandparents' house. One night, my boyfriend went upstairs to make us some food. I was sitting on the bed playing around on my phone downstairs by myself. I didn't hear him come back downstairs, but I saw something walk across the foot of the bed into the bathroom. Me, thinking that it was him, started talking to him. I'm the kind of girl that can tend to ramble, and he's not much of a talker, so I just kept on jabbering along, thinking he was in there. But then I actually heard him come down the stairs, and he flung the door open. I was really freaked out, because I had legitimately seen somebody walk across the room. But what really freaked me out was what happened two days later. I was sitting on the bed while my boyfriend was at work, talking to one of my friends on the Snapchat video thing. I looked up and I saw a smoky black silhouette of a person walk across the room and into the bathroom. What made this so much scarier than the last time was that one, it happened in broad daylight, and two, it was completely in front of me, not just out of the corner of my eye like a couple of days before. When I told my boyfriend about this, he laughed at me and said, yeah, I hear footsteps run down the stairs, stop at the door, and then run back up. This scared me and weirded me out, because he didn't even seem afraid of it. I would have been terrified. I think this was the first time that I ever really saw a ghost or whatever that basement entity was. I think the scariest thing is that I don't know what it is. A lot of people have seen actual things in this house, and I'm scared I'm going to see a full ghost one day, or whatever this thing is. Back in 2014 to 2015, I was in high school and living with my parents. My parents were heavy on Christianity growing up, so I was raised going to church two times a week. My mom is extremely spiritual as well. Anyway, for years, my mom kept telling everybody that there was a lot of spiritual warfare that was going on in our house. Everybody in my family just thought she was crazy, but I strongly believe that it was true. My sister started going down the wrong path. My dad was apparently cheating on my mom for years. Things like that. My parents started noticing some weird type of feces in our basement window wells. So one night, my mom asked me to help her find out what it was by going into the basement with the lights off and only using a flashlight. We went down there and were quietly waiting to see if we could figure out what it was when all of a sudden we heard a whisper that was so loud, it almost felt like it was coming from a surround sound speaker. It was almost as if somebody came right up into both of our ears and whispered. It immediately sent chills down my whole body, and my mom too. We both froze for a second, and my mom said, What was that? Was that you? And I said, No, what was that? We both bolted up the stairs screaming, and we refused to go back down that night. My dad tried to say that we were just crazy and hearing things. I've never felt so uncomfortable and violated in my entire life. Something definitely whispered into our ears, but we couldn't make out what it had said. 
Still to this day, thinking about it freaks me out. Since then, my parents divorced and sold the house. Growing up, I had experienced a few strange things in that house, and my sisters did as well. Sometimes we would hear what almost sounded like a phone vibrating in the basement, but we couldn't ever figure out where it was coming from. It happened multiple times in the span of five years. I truly believe that there was a demonic entity messing with my family. So, I grew up in a house that had a few spirits in it. My family are all skeptics and would find some way to explain things away. A few experiences and then I'll get to the main story. First, our house was three stories with technically three master bedrooms, one on each floor. The one on the main floor we used as an office. I would constantly hear somebody walking around in the office at night sinks turning on, toilets flushing, and occasionally I'd hear talking. My parents would always say that someone was awake and making those noises, and that the toilet and water running was just faulty pipes. Maybe on the pipes, but no one was ever awake during the other things. Second, there would be a shadow figure that would pace on the top floor. There was like a balcony that overlooked the foyer, and I would usually see who I presumed was a lady in a dress, pacing. My parents just said it was the shadow of somebody outside. We were on a hill, overlooking all of our neighbors. I don't know how they thought this was possible. Third, I hated using the upstairs bathroom, which was my bathroom. I would hear talking and singing from the bathroom. When no one was home and I was in there, someone would bang on the door. One time I was showering and listening to music. I heard the banging really loudly, so loudly that it shook the room. Then the locked door swung open and I heard a scream. My parents said it was just my brother pranking me, which is something that he never did. Anyway, on to the main event. My brother's about 10 years older than me. He was the only sibling living at home with my parents and I. He had the master bedroom in the basement. I was never really in the basement except for going to the garage because it was in the basement next to the bedroom. I always remember feeling uneasy down there, but I wanted a big room. So when my brother moved out, I begged my parents to let me have his room and eventually they caved and let me have it. I moved all of my stuff downstairs, painted it and everything. I loved my new room. I was talking to my brother about it one day and he casually says, watch out for the little girl who lives down there. She likes to laugh. I was shocked as obviously he was kidding, right? My whole family besides me never talked about stuff like that. I just laughed and shrugged it off. I figured he was probably trying to scare me. About a week after I moved into my new room, I had a friend come over and we were just laying on the floor next to the bathroom, laughing and stuff like that. She had to go to the bathroom, so she closes the door and I was just kind of zoning out. All of a sudden she goes, that's not funny. I asked her what she meant as I hadn't done anything. She said that she heard somebody laughing right outside the door, but I didn't do anything or hear anything. She left freaked out and I assumed that my brother put her up to it since she liked my brother. A few days later, I hear someone in my bedroom while I'm in the shower. I call out thinking it's my mom, but I don't hear anything. I get out and as I'm putting my robe on, I hear a little girl giggle and then, are you looking for me? I freak out. I throw open the door to my room, but nobody's there. I checked the garage and ended up setting off the house alarm. So nobody could have come or gone through there without everyone knowing. 
I run upstairs and my mom is pissed that I set off the alarm and I told her what just happened. She then told me that my brother had a similar story when we first moved in, but that it was nothing. I called my brother and asked him why he told me to watch out for the little girl. He said that I was the little girl. He said he was kidding because, quote, you would always come downstairs and giggle really creepy. I never did anything like that. I told him that, and that's when he got legitimately creeped out. I still would occasionally hear the little girl. I never saw her, but she did like to laugh and open the bathroom and closet doors. I named her Sarah. My brother called me up today to ask me about this. He asked me if I was sure that I never tried to scare him by laughing, and I told him no. He got uncomfortable. I don't think he knows how to handle the fact that our house was mildly haunted. So I decided to post this after the sixth person who has come into my basement has said that they feel off, overwhelmed, and like they're being watched. I usually bring them down to play billiards, and I have my old PS2 and Xbox 360 down there as well. The basement is finished, painted, and carpeted, and there's an office down there too. They always leave saying that they all felt the same things and that they're so put off by it that they never want to go into my basement again. Yesterday, one of my friends left his mask in my basement, went back down to get it by himself, and said that he felt like his heart was beating out of his chest. I also want to note that when we first moved in, for the first month or so, we would find an unreasonable amount of dead centipedes across the basement floor, but only in the room with the billiards table. The office room never had a single centipede in it. All of a sudden, the centipedes just stopped. Never saw one again. It's been two years. I felt the same weirdness, but I always ignored it. I'm usually afraid of basements because I generally don't like being underground, so it wasn't unusual to me. But then everyone else started talking about it. I've also noticed that my house has become more active as in lights turning on and off when nobody's home, doors opening and closing for no reason, doorknobs jiggling aggressively, things moving to very peculiar places. I really don't know what to do with this. Unseen Watchers in the Mist Last summer, my friends and I rented a cabin deep in the Rocky Mountains. We were a diverse bunch. Alex, a budding photographer. Jenna, our nature enthusiast. Mark, who always craved adventure. And me, more of a lover of cozy cabins than the wild outdoors. I suppose I would be the bookish one. I always brought a good book, set up by the fire, and let everyone else do their thing, and at night we chatted. It was nice. Our first two days were filled with hiking and barbecues. On the third night, a strange fog rolled in. It wasn't your typical mountain mist. It was denser, almost suffocating. We joked about it being like something from a horror movie, not knowing how right we were. The following morning, the fog hadn't lifted. It was so thick we literally couldn't see the trees that I knew were just a few feet from the cabin. Alex, ever the brave soul, suggested we explore. Despite my deep reservations, I agreed. Stepping outside, the fog felt alive, almost clinging to us. We stuck closer together, Jenna leading the way with her knowledge of the area. The silence was the first thing that struck me. No birds, no rustling leaves, just our footsteps and heavy breathing. We hadn't gone far when Alex stopped abruptly, his eyes wide with fear. Do you see that? 
he whispered. Through the fog, we could make out faint, glowing eyes. Not just one pair, but several, all around us. Panic set in, and Mark muttered something about it being just animals. But these eyes were different. They were too high off the ground, too still, and their glow was unnatural. We stood frozen, watching as more eyes appeared, forming a loose circle around us. Jenna, usually super calm, grabbed my arm tight. We need to go back, she hissed. Turning around wasn't easy. The eyes seemed to follow us, and I could feel their gaze piercing through me. We moved quickly, almost running back to the cabin. Once inside, we locked the doors and huddled together, not speaking. The fog lingered all day, and so did the eyes. We could see them from the windows, unblinking, just watching us. Phones were useless. The thick fog seemed to swallow any signal. Nightfall brought even more terror. We heard sounds outside, like whispers carried on the wind. We heard dragging along the side of the cabin, like claws. Mark tried to convince us that it was just the trees, but trees don't usually drag on the ground level, from one side of the cabin to the other. And trees don't usually whisper names. My name, Jenna's name, Alex's name, Mark's name, all whispered in a chilling, taunting tone. Of course, we didn't sleep that night. The next morning, the fog was gone, and with it, the eyes and the whispers. We were not going to let that lull us into a sense of safety. We had been given a warning, and we were going to heed it. We packed up and left, without ever looking back. My boyfriend and I rented a cabin in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. We arrived on Tuesday. By Wednesday morning, I awoke with a deep cut on my hip. On Thursday morning, we were awoken by the TV turning on by itself. On Friday, my boyfriend started seeing shadows out of the corner of his eye. And then that night into Saturday morning, we were about to go to sleep at 3.30. We stayed up really late. As soon as we turned off the lights to sleep, we heard a deep guttural growl that lasted for about two seconds. We both immediately froze and then turned the lights back on. Now we were wide awake. We then realized that pictures of one child in the house had been defaced and an extremely heavy chandelier started swinging. I'm not entirely sure what was in there, and we're not totally positive if it's safe to return. Last summer, my friends and I decided to spend a week at my family's cabin. It was a week filled with a lot of unexplainable occurrences, which reached their climax on the final day. It all started soon after my parents left. One evening, a friend of mine returned from a late night run, gasping about a black figure that he had spotted in the woods. We found it odd, but we didn't dwell on it all too much. The following day was fairly uneventful, except for a late night jacuzzi session around one to three in the morning. We began discussing the scariest dreams we had ever had, it took a serious turn when one friend shared his recurring experience of a tall black figure appearing in his dreams and his room at night when he was a child. The sincerity in his tear-filled eyes was unsettling. As he spoke, I distinctly heard footfalls in the woods below us, but I decided not to mention it until the next day. Needless to say, we were all quite unnerved at this point. On the final day, with no specific plans, we lounged around the cabin. 
As the night deepened, about one to two in the morning again, one friend complained about his towel repeatedly falling off the hook, despite him hanging it up securely. Even stranger, his blanket that was previously on his bed was now strewn about the floor, and the bathroom cabinets kept opening on their own. By 4 a.m., shaken by these incidents, we decided to call it a night. Owing to our collective fear, two of my friends opted to stay in my room. As we were settling down, one of them asked if I heard rustling sounds from the kitchen and living room. I didn't. Nevertheless, we cautiously ventured into the living room. The moment I switched on my phone's flashlight, I was gripped by an overwhelming sense of dread. The cushions from the couch and chair were standing vertically, and the pelts that were on the chairs were tossed on the floor. In a state of panic, we fled the cabin and made a rather futile attempt to call the police. Predictably, they couldn't do anything and probably dismissed us as kids hallucinating on some potent substance. It was about 5 a.m. by then, and not a wink of sleep was had that day. The experience of that week remains vivid in all of our minds. Suffice it to say, I am pretty sure my cabin is haunted. My grandparents, along with my grandma's sister and her husband, would go to Ontario, Canada every year for a fishing vacation. The area in Ontario is about 200 miles north of International Falls, Minnesota. During these vacations, they would go park by the garbage dump at dusk and watch the bears come out. Sadly, the local bear population had been reduced to eating garbage due to the presence of humans. Being from the south side of Chicago, it was fun and interesting for my grandparents, particularly my grandma. One evening, my grandma and my Aunt Beth were parked on the rim of the dump and sitting in Beth's car, looking down at the bears in the dump below. While my grandma sees one bear on his hind legs, he turns and makes eye contact with her. To her dismay, she realized that this was not a bear. It was Bigfoot. He looked at me with such evil in his eyes, she said. She screamed at Beth to start the car and to get out of there. Beth, hearing the tone of my grandma's voice, did what she said without asking any questions until they were a safe distance away. After they got out of there, Beth pulled over and my grandma told her what she saw. My grandma passed away in 1993. She was a wonderful person and had an open mind to what is now referred to as high strangeness. I think that's where I get my interest in it. Reflection. I've always been fascinated by antiques, so when I found an old or neatly framed mirror in the attic of the cabin I was renovating in rural Maine, it felt like striking gold. The cabin itself was a fixer-upper, inherited from a distant relative. I had planned to turn it into a cozy retreat. The first time I saw it, the mirror seemed normal, albeit a bit dusty. It was only after I cleaned and hung it in my bedroom that things got strange. That night, as I prepared for bed, I glanced in the mirror and froze. There was a shadowy figure standing behind me. It was so distinct, so unnerving. I whirled around, heart pounding. There was nothing there. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the light or my tired mind playing tricks. However, it happened again the next night, and every night after. Each time I looked in the mirror, the shadowy figure was there, just standing, its features too blurred to make out. I tried moving the mirror to different spots, but it made no difference. The figure was always there, always just a reflection. It never moved, never made a sound, just 
stood there, watching me. Sleep became elusive. I started researching the cabin's history. It turned out that the cabin had quite a grim past. It was originally owned by a reclusive man, known for his eccentric behavior. Locals whispered about him practicing strange rituals and dabbling in the occult. His sudden disappearance years ago remained a mystery. The more I learned, the more I became convinced that the figure in the mirror was connected to the cabin's former owner. Maybe it was his spirit or something he had summoned. The thought sent shivers down my spine. One night, driven by a mixture of fear and curiosity, I decided to confront it. I stood before the mirror and addressed the figure directly, asking what it wanted and why it was here. There was no response, just the silent, eerie stare from the shadow. Frustrated and scared, I covered the mirror with a cloth. That's when things escalated. Strange noises filled the cabin at night, knocks, whispers, things I couldn't explain. It was as if covering the mirror had angered whatever it was tied to. I had had enough. I couldn't live in fear any longer. I took the mirror out into the woods and buried it, hoping that would end whatever connection it had to the cabin. The next few nights were peaceful. The strange occurrences stopped. But the feeling of being watched, that never really went away. I sold the cabin soon after unable to shake off the experiences I had had there, no longer desiring to turn it into that cozy retreat. It felt like a lie after what I'd been through. I had this really strange experience last year, and my brother just told me about BEKs, and I feel like that's what I saw. So last year during Christmas time, my sister and I were having a hard emotional night, and we decided to go around looking at Christmas lights. I was driving, and we were just crying and talking and looking at the decorations. There was a meteor shower that night, and we ended up on this super creepy back road with nothing around. No houses or buildings, no street lights, just woods. Somehow we both saw a meteor falling in the sky as I was driving, and we both screamed with shock and excitement. As we looked back down the road, there was a small child on the side of the road. It had a backpack and was just staring at the car with this insanely scary grimace on its face, with huge black sunken in eyes. It didn't move its body but its head was moving with the car as we drove past, tracking us. We freaked the hell out, screaming and crying in just an utter shock of what the heck was that. It filled us with such terror and we were both so distraught and upset. We couldn't stop shaking and crying and we couldn't rid ourselves of this horrible feeling. I felt guilty for stopping if it was somebody that needed help, but it was in the middle of nowhere in winter, late at night, nothing was around that road, and there was just no reason for someone to be there. They weren't trying to flag us down for help, just staring. We called the cops and went home and couldn't sleep all night. No joke, I still have PTSD when I drive at night. I drew a picture when I got home, so I would never forget what it looked like, but sometimes I wish I could. to get up at 7 a.m. to do some chores, and as soon as I was done, I felt really sleepy, and I wanted to get some rest, because I'd only fallen asleep at about 2 a.m. the night before. I was starting to fall asleep, and at that point, I felt that it was going to be some weird astral projection or dream experience, because that always happens when I haven't rested well, and I'm more vulnerable. I was in a room that was pretty similar to my own but the colors were a bit different, and I had two light bulbs on my ceiling. 
So this girl that's in my room starts talking to me. She's right behind the bed frame. And she starts asking me weirdly specific questions that she shouldn't even be able to ask me. The first light bulb starts flickering and I suddenly started to feel this demonic energy around me. So I looked at the girl and when I pointed out what was happening to the lights, the other light bulb just went off completely and the girl went silent and her eyes changed to black as if the lights in the room were keeping her from looking like her real self. At that point, I felt like I couldn't wake up and my first and only instinct and what I ended up doing was to start scratching at her face and eyes. I think in this weird state that I was in, I managed to poke her eyes out, after which I woke up really dizzy. The strange thing is, I don't believe that it was something I saw or read about in real life that caused me to dream about this, because frankly enough, I hadn't even heard of black-eyed kids in around four or five years. They hadn't even been on my radar. That's the last time I had ever heard or read something about them. I don't know if this was one of them or something else, but it was definitely weird. I keep hearing howls and human-like whoops near the area where I'm camping in Utah. There's a lot of strange activity, such as strange smells around the tents, like a dirty wild animal, noises, and even items being thrown and damaged. I am convinced that it is not a bear, and so are my friends. But we're unsure as to what to do since the activity seems to be more frequent and sort of aggressive. The dogs act up by barking and whimpering on certain nights, as if there were a larger animal nearby. There's also the occasional feeling that we're being watched during the night, and some of us have had rocks thrown at us while walking out down between the two hills. These two hills kind of make a small canyon by a gorge. We have flattened the soil where we think it is at night, hoping to get tracks, but so far we've gotten nothing. We have read about bears, but we have come to the conclusion that this is not a bear. It could be nothing, but I am certain that something is not right about whatever is stalking us. One of my friends just reported that while collecting dry firewood, he saw a large ape with shaggy red-brown fur standing at a good eight feet tall. He said it was far up a hill, kind of crouched, observing him from above. Yeah, we're pretty sure it's not a bear. When I was younger, I used to spend hours in the woods behind my house. One time, when I was about nine or 10 years old, I was in the woods and I saw some stepping stones that led into a clearing. Those stones had never been there before. I peeked into the clearing and saw this little cabin with smoke coming from the chimney. It was surrounded by a well manicured lawn. Although it looked peaceful, charming even, something in my head said, run. So I did. About a week later, I went back into the woods to the same spot and the clearing was normal again. No stones, no cabin, just a basic clearing, the same one that I had grown up with. I haven't stepped into those woods again ever since and it's been about 20 years. I don't know what that cabin was, how it appeared or why it disappeared. And I don't know what would have happened if I had followed the steps and gone up to it. But to this day, I'm just very glad that I didn't. I was up north at my uncle's cabin. 
when I saw something really strange. I'm laying in bed at night and it was like one o'clock in the morning, so it was pretty dark outside. We're surrounded by trees everywhere. I'm laying on the bed upstairs and I'm staring outside at the windows which are downstairs because I can see it from where I'm at. The windows are very large. From the far left window, I see this massive bright white orb floating above the deck or porch. It moves back and forth between the one window and the other. I can't fully remember if I saw it pass over or behind one of the blind spots between the windows, but it just kept going back and forth multiple times with some speed. I gaze at the window and watch the orb travel from one side of the window to the other side multiple times. The size of the orb, from what I can remember, would be about the size of a large watermelon. I know that it was not the moon. Even when the porch is wet, the light of the moon doesn't really reflect. It was just my dad, my grandpa, and I there. There's also one other important thing. This place is where my uncle David's ashes are buried. Not my uncle the owner, but my mom's other brother. He's not buried near the porch of the house, though. But I still wonder if it might have been him. This happened around the time that I was 11 years old. My dad had just bought a log cabin in the woods of Maine. The place was completely dead, and while we had neighbors, we rarely saw them. We had already spent a few nights up there on a previous trip, about a 250 mile trip just to get there. We decided to take another trip up there for a long weekend. As this cabin was old, my parents decided to get some work done on it to make it more appealing so they hired people to come and redo some things in the rooms. At the time, there was only one bedroom available for us to sleep in. As night fell, we all got ready to sleep. There were six of us in that one room. Mom, Dad, me, two brothers, and sister. In the middle of the night, I wake up to audibly clear boot steps in the living room. The bedroom was connected to the living room. All that was between us was an old wooden door and a rusty deadbolt lock that would definitely come off if somebody were to kick the door in. As I was still waking up, I was in that foggy state that you are kind of when you're just becoming conscious. I wasn't all there. But then I heard the voice of my sister saying, do you hear that? So now I know that this isn't just part of a dream leaking into reality. I sit up quickly and look to the other bed, and both of my parents and my sister are looking at the door and looking at each other. My heart starts to race, not knowing what to think. I then hear my sister say, are we going to die? Which really doesn't help the situation at hand. As my other brother starts waking up, the boot steps stop for a moment and then continue. Mind you, there was no fading of the steps, which means that the sound came from a general area. We continue to just look at each other in fear and worry, none of us knowing how or why somebody would get into our cabin. As my last brother begins to wake up, the boot steps stop. My dad then gets out of bed and grabs the machete that he placed under the bed and heads toward the door. Placing his ear to the door slowly to try to see if he can hear anything else, he can't. Then, in one quick motion, he unlocks and opens the door while wielding his weapon, prepared for anybody that might be there. He walks out into the living room, then to the other rooms to see if anything was there but everything was clear. As a matter of fact, all the doors and windows were locked. There was no possible entry into the cabin, seeing as nothing had been tampered with. 
It was really hard to get back to sleep that night. As I woke up that morning, I remembered what had happened the previous night. I remembered hearing those boot steps, and I even confirmed with my family that it wasn't a dream and that we all experienced the same thing. As there was no possible way that a person could have entered the house, I came to the conclusion that this was paranormal. I had my share of paranormal experiences growing up. My family and I have tried to debunk this a hundred ways, but we just can't come up with a solid solution. If you think you have a reasonable cause for this incident, let me know. And before somebody says it was somebody outside or an animal, no. I know for a fact that the boot steps came from inside the house. This was definitely one of the scariest experiences of my life. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old, and I was playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in Northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor and I, were playing hide and seek in the forest. The only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course, we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and I wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure that it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too. And when I pointed it out, they confirmed that it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth, changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it for, I can't remember how long, but we reached a small cabin and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point and curiosity got the better of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it. But I did, and I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside, and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars. Then a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled to the other kids to run back the way we had come, and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could, and we didn't stop until we were inside the house and I locked the door behind us. I remember getting in trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what we saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not even sure what I saw or if what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sounds of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight, and I asked my mom, who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults, what was going on. The adults had stayed over after the party, and they were all just standing there, their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard. I stood there and tried to peek through the kitchen window with them. My mom says that they found the body of a woman in the forest, and a cabin where her killer was staying. There was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night. The glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopter was only one of the reasons. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer, or maybe it was something more nefarious. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin that we had seen. Maybe they did, and maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to even go near the tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. 
I'm 24 now and have had many other experiences since then, but this is the one that I actually forgot about and was reminded of recently when reading up on Will-O-Wisps. I just thought I would share where it all began for me. I think it was maybe three years ago when this happened. I remember that it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family and I's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food, last minute packages for some friends and something else. I don't really remember exactly why they went out, but that's not so important. My point is that I was all alone in our cabin. I was playing some games on my phone and listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me because I didn't really like being alone in general, especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had nearly forgotten all about the strange shadow. But then I saw it again. And this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment. So I decided to lock the door to my room. Right after I locked the door, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first, I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot. I asked out loud, what's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs. When it finally hit me, I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs was not my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers, and it was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still. And even though I couldn't make out any eyes, I got the feeling that it was staring at me. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for maybe about 30 minutes, and I cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to enter ours. Ever since that day, I refuse to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling that I got that day in the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me. I still have nightmares about that shadow figure thing even today, it's haunting my dreams. I was up near Antelope Lake, California, exploring this old mining town known as Lucky S with my girlfriend and her parents. There were a total of four of us. Lucky S is out in the middle of nowhere on this seemingly endless fire road. Then it just appears from the forest and you suddenly find yourself between at least four cabins, all in different stages of collapsing. When we got there, it was in the middle of the day, no later than 2 p.m. with clear skies. 
Knowing I was going into buildings that may or may not be haunted, I wanted to try to capture anything and everything that I could. So I brought my Nikon to take photos. We explored four or five cabins, ate some food, and then walked about a quarter mile farther up the road to the second half of this rundown town. While my girlfriend's dad was examining some old piece of large machinery and explaining how it used to work, I walked off alone to check out the next cabin. There were no steps leading up to this one, so the easiest way inside the structure was to either get a running start and jump in or pull yourself up by grabbing onto either side of the doorway. I elected for the run and jump version and totally ripped my shorts down the leg. I'm in this rundown cabin and I take a shot of my girlfriend and her parents outside the other building. I turn and take shots of the holes in the roof of the cabin I'm in and then I hear an odd noise, like one of them is shuffling debris just outside the doorway that I jumped through. So I stop and stand still, listening. Then I hear an obviously loud knocking coming from the doorway. I quickly turned and I see all three of the people that I'm with still outside the structure across the way. No one was near me. So I turn back toward the other end of the cabin, the one that I'm in, and I just stare toward the doorway. Seconds later, there's more shuffling, followed by three obvious footsteps. The first one is the loudest, I think, because of how you have to enter the building. You can't just step in. So these three footsteps sounded like they walked right toward me and then stopped. I stood there for a few more seconds and then slowly walked toward the doorway. After that, I never heard anything again. It was my first and only experience like this. I wasn't alone. It was in the middle of the day it was outside and it was very sunny and bright, so I guess that's the least scary way to experience this. In any case, I'll take it. Either way, there was nobody near me and nobody in the cabin with me that could have made that sound. So I don't know what happened, but it definitely wasn't natural. This happened a few years ago, but my husband and I still talk about it. If he hadn't been there, I would have written it off as some kind of dream. My husband and I were walking around on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. We decide to stop for a drink at the hotel and soak in the ocean view. We walk up to the hotel and we didn't notice much until we walked inside. When we walked into the hotel, the entire hotel was empty. Nobody was there. There was nobody behind the counters, not a single soul in the lobby, just empty. But it also had this weird buzz of energy, as though people had just been there. There were papers on the counters, cups on the tables. We walked inside through the restaurant outside by the pool no one. We walked back inside through the lobby. We probably spent about five to ten minutes there, and we never saw one person. We left because it was so creepy. Back on the street, everything was normal. People walking by, traffic, everything you would expect. I have no idea what caused no one to be there. It almost felt like the Truman Show where you go off the script and they don't have any actors ready. I would love any thoughts on what you think happened. Also, we were totally sober, and we thought perhaps it could have been evacuated, but there would have been people on the streets. I mean, it's a hotel. We asked around later, and nobody knew anything about anything that had happened that would warrant a hotel, so... To this day, we still don't know what happened.
This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006. So at the time, I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy, but it was nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids' socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking. It wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it. So it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot, seemingly a girl's, with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were gonna go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful, we had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there, and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall, and I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we start to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out, and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek, yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come, 
Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Literally, none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there. And now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house, where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point, she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car? This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Hui. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went, and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, Hui makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day. And I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, and nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time, and no physical person could have put that dirty old ant infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way. I've only shared this experience with a few people in the years since it happened. It was the first Tuesday of the Pennsylvania deer season, December 3rd, 2013. I've always been an avid hunter and I would wake up very early in the morning to get into the woods before daylight. I would be in the woods at 4.30 in the morning. Having to hunt on state game lands meant beating other people into the woods to get a decent spot. When I got to the parking area at about 4.15, nobody else was there. So I walked into the woods, not using a flashlight, just walking by moonlight. I walked through a field into the tree line and started on the path to my spot. I came to the intersection in the path. One way went left and down the mountain. The other way went right. I went right 
because my spot was on the other side. Roughly 50 yards after making the right-hand turn, I smelled what I could only describe as hot garbage. It hit me in the face. Like, I mean hot dumpster juice in the middle of August. So I stopped dead, turned on my flashlight, expecting to see piles of garbage, but nothing. No garbage, nothing dead, just that hot garbage smell. Keep in mind, this is in December. It's cold out, high 20s to low 30s. So even if there was garbage, it shouldn't smell that bad. So I kind of thought nothing of it. I followed the path to my spot, which was down over the ridge from the garbage smell, roughly 40 feet down. That leads into a grass field where I would sit. I set up my seat, got settled in for about two minutes, and that's when the rocks started coming down the ridge. The first rock startled me, causing me to turn on my light again, scanning the field hoping to see eye reflection of a deer, but nothing was there. I sat back down. Another rock comes down the ridge. This time I stand up to go into the grass field with a flashlight and the pistol that I carry while hunting. I scanned again. Nothing. I purposefully waited in that field for about five minutes. Now I'm getting angry, assuming that another hunter is messing with me because I'm in their spot. I sit down again. The third rock, sounding larger than the others, comes tumbling down the ridge. I don't get up this time. Not two minutes after that, another rock, not tumbled, but sounded as though it was thrown off the ridge and landed in the field. Now I'm pissed. I gathered up my gear and started back up to the trail, to the ridge. I get on top of the ridge, scanning with my light the whole time. Nothing. No eyes, no other hunter. I get to the spot where I had smelled the hot garbage. Nothing, including the smell. It's just gone. Finally, it all clicked in my head. It may not have been another person. It might have been something else. I've heard stories of people's Bigfoot experiences, a lot of which remark about how bad they smell and about rocks being thrown. I thought, screw this. I all but ran out of the woods, and to top it off, no other vehicles were in the parking area when I got out of the woods. This took place in Pennsylvania State Game Lands 229, outside of Tremont, in Schuylkill County. I later came to find out that a co-worker of mine had actually seen a bipedal cross in front of his car within two miles of the location of my experience. So maybe they're real. I don't know. But I definitely had an experience that I won't soon forget. This is a recollection of a campout I had a few summers ago. The exact details have started to become fuzzy, but I'll try to relay it as best I can. It was Boy Scout Camp, Northern Wisconsin. There's maybe a little over a dozen of us, some scout leaders too, all within a little clearing that makes up where one of many troops are set up. Two boys to each tent. My best friend and I from very early childhood are tent buddies. And on maybe the third night at this camp, is when all of this happened. I remember falling asleep pretty normally. It was dark and I wasn't the last one to leave the campfire after dinner. My friend and I were both in our sleeping bags on opposite sides of the tent, our bags at our side and our hiking boots right by the door, carefully removed when we entered the tent. I woke up to strange sounds, hard breathing or maybe soft grunting. It was the dead of night, 2 to 3 a.m. must have been. I'm frozen and I look around at the walls of the tent, but nothing seems amiss, just this heavy, low, breathy sound. I see that my buddy is awake at this point and we're both frozen, terrified. He opened his mouth to say something, 
but I put a finger to my lips, like the shh gesture. Behind his head, right where he's laying, something is brushing up against the tent wall, poking into the fabric, almost in the shape of an antler. My friend sees it and lets out a small gasp. Something pokes through the tent suddenly, sharp and black, not an antler. A loud exhale, and then whatever it was just steps back. We hear branches crunch and twigs snap, fading into the distance. We stayed awake for another hour, in hushed whispers trying to rationalize what just happened. I asked if we should check outside the tent. Neither of us remember falling asleep again, but we must have, because we woke up in the morning. The hole in the tent was still there, along with three to four similar ones on various sides of our tent. By the time the other boys in the camp were waking up, I had the courage to check around the tent to see if there were footprints or broken twigs, something, just to determine what had been outside of our tent. Well, I found something. Behind our tent, I kid you not, were bare human footprints. They circled around our tent several times but they never led to or from the tent. Just three to four rings of human footprints in a loop. Whatever it was that happened, whatever it was that was there, my buddy and I talked about it a few more times on that trip. But ever since, we won't speak of it to each other. I saw a story pop up on my Reddit feed about a black-eyed kid. It scared me because I saw a black-eyed kid once, and it haunts me to this day. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal. I lived in a small and remote village. One night, I woke up and I thought I heard something at my door. I got up, cracked the door, and I saw nothing there. I thought perhaps it was a deer or a porcupine, but there was nothing. I closed the door, turned around, and got back into bed. The second I turned around, I saw a child, black outline, white face, black hair, and deep black eyes. I laid there, stunned. I quickly pulled the covers over my face. The moment I did that, I woke up. I guess it was a dream. The same night sequence in the dream was reality. It was freaky. It felt so real. I can remember that boy's outline and eyes. A week or so later, my host father unexpectedly passed away. It was devastating to the family and entire community. For a long time, I thought that encounter was a bad omen. At times, I try to think that it wasn't related at all. It was weird timing, and it scared me then. And it still scares me now. For some background, this happened back in the 80s. I was between 9 and 10. I was an only child at this point and my mother was a single mom. She had taken all the money that she had and bought a trailer and some land and moved out to the country. I can still remember how she installed the septic system, installed the plumbing and an electrical pole and how we wired that to the house. This had given me great fascination with electricity. I was always helping her with these projects. I grew up knowing a lot more than most kids about these kinds of things. We lived in a rural area in East Texas on a two-acre tract of land. Houses were sparse and situated quite far apart, so not a heavily populated area. I was a lonely kid for the most part living out there, but I digress. I'll move on to the day they came. My mom was busy with something in her room, which was situated at the far end of the 72-foot trailer we lived in. 
I went to the kitchen for something and heard a knock at the door. I went to open it and found four kids standing outside, two boys and two girls. I opened the screen door and the larger of the boys asked, can we use your phone? We need to call our mom. I was immediately suspicious because where had these kids come from? I lived here a few years and knew all the kids in the neighborhood. I remember looking at the larger boy's eyes and thinking something was different about him, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I shrugged and opened the screen wider and let them in. I left the front door open as I took them into the kitchen and pointed to where the phone was. The larger boy picked up the phone as my mom called to me. I ran into my mom's room and she said, who's in the house? I told her a bunch of kids wanted to use the phone. She looked angry and said, you don't let anyone in the house, tell them to leave. I walked out of her room and back to the kitchen to tell them that they had to go and found the phone off the hook. The front door was still open and the screen door was closed. I ran to the door and outside to look for the kids, but they were nowhere to be found. They couldn't have had time to walk or run across two acres to get to the street. So where were they? After that happened, life was super weird. Mom was always getting sick, unable to find sustainable work, and became heavily paranoid. She got into damaging relationships with men. Of the most weird occurrences were when she didn't have the ability to pay the phone bill. So the phone company came and disconnected the phone. However, we kept getting calls. I rarely ever answered the phone. So when my mom told me this, I was skeptical and I didn't really believe her. Then one day she was busy outside and the phone rang. So I answered it. I heard a woman say hello on the other end. It sounded just like my aunt and then it all just went to static. When my mom came back in, I told her what had occurred. So she went to a neighbor's and called the phone company to ask them to check the line that our phone was still ringing. They came out, inspected the line and the pole and came inside and told my mom, there's no way you're getting phone calls. The line is completely disconnected. It's cut at the pole. This happened constantly, even after my mom moved the trailer to another city. In that city, she had failed to pay the bill again, and again we kept getting phone calls that ended in dead air, or strange voices, or static. Their linesman told her the same thing, that there was no way our phone was ringing, but yet it was. To this day, I really don't know what to make of any of that, but it was also around this time that I began to experience things like words of knowledge, clairaudient experiences, where I would know things that I had never learned and I would hear things just before they happened in physical reality. I mostly kept those experiences to myself and I would just think, how weird. When mom sold that trailer, we never had those weird phone experiences again and the clairaudience also went away. There were a few other weird occurrences too. While still living in the country, I was sitting on my mom's bed next to her. She was saying, it feels like there's bugs crawling all over me. I got off the bed and walked over to her dresser. And for some reason, I felt the need to look up. On the ceiling, there were tons of tiny spiders. I am not exaggerating when I say there could have been millions of itsy bitsy tiny little spiders. I knew my mom would freak out. So I just said, mom, please get up and leave the room. She looked at me with a look of concern and asked why. I said, just trust me, get out of the room. She then gave me a look like I was simply being impossible. So finally I said, look up. I have never seen her leave a room so fast after she looked up and saw that mess, literal arachnophobia. We fumigated the house directly after that several times a year. It could be unrelated, but I've never seen anything like that before or since. After we'd moved the trailer to another city, some lights would either dim or get brighter and brighter when we turned them on until they literally popped. When mom called the electric company, they sent an electrician out to inspect. He climbed the pole and when he went to test one of the lines, it literally popped him off the pole and he flew to the ground. He was okay, though a little shocked, pun intended, and shaken. 
The electric company's stance on the issue is that there was a miswiring at the pole. It was most likely that they missed the ground. Again, could be unrelated, but the circuit breakers never tripped during these episodes. In hindsight, it was all just really, really weird. I want to start this off by saying that I live in my mom's basement. Many people have said that they think it's haunted. Weird things have happened, like the washer turning on by itself, and sometimes even clothes appearing folded when they hadn't been folded previously. That's in the back room, though there's a larger main part that I live in. My bed and TV are set up where our pool table used to be placed when I was younger. In the middle of the night, when everyone else in the house was asleep, I used to hear people playing pool. So that area is no stranger to spirits. When I first moved down there around two months ago, I woke up to a dark figure standing a few feet away from me. It didn't seem threatening. It was just a little weird. I've also had other paranormal experiences. I don't know if they're related to the entities in the basement or what, but I guess I'll share them here too. For instance, yesterday, my YouTube showed numerous profile pictures that weren't mine, but only on my Apple TV and only on the top corner icon when I would click on the profile. It would show my normal one, which is just the standard issued one. But then on the Apple TV, all these other ones appeared. I just stared at it for a minute, confused, then got up to look at the picture and it had something to do with God. I couldn't really read it because of how small the icon was, but it seemed to be some type of Bible verse. Then before my eyes, the profile picture changed again to what looked like a picture of Jesus. So seeing this, I ran to my computer figuring somebody was on my account and I should probably change my password. But that's when I discovered that the icon on my account there was totally normal. No one knew had logged into my account and there were only three devices on that account, my computer, my Apple TV, and my Xbox. So I once again looked back at the TV and the icon was now different. This time I could actually read it. It said, the power of Christ compels you. This slightly shook me to my core, and I ran back to my computer to change my password. Eventually, the profile icon went back to normal on its own a few hours later, which was also somehow slightly alarming. Like I said, I don't know if this has anything to do with what's going on in the basement, but my TV's in the basement, so maybe. I hope this made sense. I don't know if anything like this has happened to anyone else, but please let me know if it has. This happened in 2005 to 2006. I was 16 to 17 and living at home in my parents' basement. I had just started dating a girl a little younger than me that claimed she had the ability to communicate with spirits. I was pretty skeptical of her abilities, but being a teenage boy, I didn't really think too much of it as I was attracted to her and that was all that mattered. I had just gotten home from a soccer game I had early that morning and I walked downstairs and everything was pulled up from under our staircase in our laundry room. I asked my dad why everything was out, and he told me that instead of using the litter box, the cats had been going under the stairs, so he had to get under there and clean it all up. I helped him a little bit and then went to my room to shower as my girlfriend was coming over. So I hop in the shower and about 10 minutes into the shower I start hearing a very loud aggressive banging on the door. It made me jump, but of course, I just thought my dad needed something from me. So I shouted, one second, dad, I'm just in the shower. 
Not even two seconds go by, and I hear more frantic banging. I'm a little annoyed at this point, and I just go, Dude, I'm in the shower. One second. A couple more seconds go by, and more banging persists. Finally, I'm getting pretty mad, so I reach out of my shower to grab a towel, storm over to the door, and angrily open it. I shout down, Okay, what do you want? I'm taking a shower. And of course, nobody was there. I'm a little weirded out at this point. I had chills run down my spine. The basement always creeped me out. So I poke my head out and look to the other side of the basement, thinking maybe he was storming off or something, and there it is. A black figure standing there, as if I had caught him off guard. No eyes, no mouth. Just a figure, standing there looking at me. We stared at each other for a second or two, and then he moved across the hallway toward the laundry room. I slammed the door shut and started hyperventilating. What was I going to do? I had to pass the laundry room to get upstairs. I quickly got dressed and gingerly opened my door and looked to the other side of the basement. Nothing. No sign of the figure. I tiptoed up toward the other side of the basement until I could see the stairs, and I ran up them. The first thing I did was call out for my dad. My mom heard me and answered, He's in the garage. I ran out to the garage and said kind of awkwardly, Hey, Dad? Were you banging on my bedroom door like five minutes ago? My dad turned and looked at me kind of confused and said, No? Why? I didn't know what to say. I think I was in shock. I realized that whatever that thing was physically hit my door. If it could do that, what else was it capable of? So I'm sitting there in the garage with this blank look on my face, and I hear the dog start barking inside. At this point, I realized that my girlfriend must have pulled in the front of the house. So I run to the house and meet her at the front door and try to play it off like everything is normal. She walks in and has a worried look on her face. She goes, what did you do? I was like, what do you mean? She goes, you've changed something about the house. Whatever you've changed, you need to change it back. Now. I explained to her that the cats made a mess under the stairs, so my dad had to pull everything out to clean it. She told me to put everything back the way it was. And we did. For the five or six more years that I lived in that basement, I never had a problem. I didn't see anything. But every time I walked past that laundry room, I got goosebumps. I was never sure whether I should believe in the paranormal or not. Sure, I'd heard strange noises home alone at night, or felt the energy in the house shift to something more sinister in a matter of seconds. But what I experienced in August of 2021 convinced me. It's taken a long time to process what I had experienced. I've mostly tried to pretend that it didn't happen. And to be honest, I really wish it hadn't. For context, last August, I had moved into the guest bedroom in our basement. I'm 15, and having the entire basement to myself for most of the day and all night was awesome. I immediately began to regret my decision, though, as I discovered how unsettling the energy in my basement is. It's really hard to explain, but it just feels off, especially at night. I was literally always on edge whenever I was down there. Sleeping was quite difficult, as I was never really calm. I often felt an overwhelming presence watching over me, and I was really hating my decision. But I knew my mom would be upset if I changed my mind so soon, so I endured the hell I was living in. I quickly need to describe the layout of my basement so you can understand where everything is taking place. Once you enter my basement, there's a large living area. Attached to that is a hallway that leads to where I've been sleeping. 
So I woke up at around one to two in the morning to the sounds of about four voices in the living area of the basement. I could never actually make out what they were talking about, maybe because I had just woken up, but I'm pretty sure they were speaking in another language or maybe very broken English. As I was listening to the voices, I heard quiet footsteps approaching my door. The only way that I was sure they were footsteps was because the floor in our basement, especially in the hallway, is very creaky. I pulled the covers over my head and shut my eyes. I fell asleep almost immediately and nothing else happened that night. I've also felt people touch me in the basement, but usually those experiences are comforting. I usually believe that to be my father who passed away in 2015 as I've only felt those when I'm sad or angry. Still paranormal, but unrelated to the experience I just told you about. Either way, that experience in the basement terrified me. And I'm still not sure how to explain it. First, a little background information that's important to fully understand the story. My mother's sister and her husband have a house in Colorado that has a finished basement. The basement has a fully furnished bedroom, bathroom, a sort of living room area with a couch and TV, and a little kitchenette as well. I grew up visiting my three cousins, aunt, uncle, and grandparents every summer from the time I was five up until two or three years ago. I'm 21 now. The basement became more or less the guest room, so that's where I would stay whenever I would visit, so that I could have a little space of my own. That and the fact that their cat rarely ever went down to the basement and I am severely allergic to cats. This particular event occurred around the time that I was 17 or 18, and my younger cousin, I'll call her Megan, was around 16 or 15. The night started totally normal. We all had dinner, listened to music, watched something, and then at around midnight, we all headed off to bed. Because of a different experience I had down there a few years prior, I was really nervous about staying in the basement alone. So my wonderful cousin Megan took one for the team and had been staying in the basement with me for the duration of my trip. We had been chilling in the living room of the basement for about three hours, drawing and just hanging out when it all started. I was in the process of explaining the premise of a show I had started when we heard what sounded like an old man clearing his throat coming from the bathroom. I knew it wasn't her since I was maintaining eye contact with her the whole time and her mouth hadn't opened at all. And she also knew it wasn't me since I was in the middle of speaking. And of course, neither of us are old men. We both paused and then confirmed that we had both heard the cough. Our minds immediately went to, there's a man hiding in the bathroom, since they had had some people in the past attempt to break in through the basement windows. I wanted to go upstairs and get one of her older siblings to check it out, but Megan insisted on checking it out ourselves. We went to the bathroom, turned on the lights, and saw that it was completely empty. There was, however, a linen closet, which had the door closed. She opened the door and we saw what honestly looked like the shape of a man trying to hide under some blankets. Megan immediately reared her leg back and kicked the blanket with full force, only to discover that it was just some blankets spilling over the lower shelves that we had forgotten existed. As Megan tended to her now stubbed toes, we heard that same cough come from what sounded like the entrance to the basement. We slowly crept out of the bathroom, looked around the basement to no avail, and without a word, both started packing up all of our stuff, 
like our sketchbooks and my laptop. And, rather than leave the basement, we just went to the bedroom and locked the door. There was a giant floor-length mirror in the room which we used to bar the door. We did all of this in complete silence, some weird primal understanding going on between us that we had to be as quiet as humanly possible. As we tiptoed around the room, we heard what sounded like shuffling outside the door. At that point, I was still somewhat convinced that there was a living person in the basement with us since the sounds were so clear and the feeling of there being someone else down there was so strong. Megan settled onto the bed while I sat against the wall next to the vanity, charging my phone. We were texting each other rather than speaking since that pressure of being silent was still incredibly intense. We decided to each spam text her siblings, trying to wake them up to come down to our rescue, but there was no reply. Megan even texted her mom, but still, nobody woke up. I texted my mom, who did wake up, but all she said was to call the police if we were certain that somebody was down there with us. While we knew that there was something in the basement with us, we didn't know if it was actually someone who had broken in, and neither of us wanted to risk bothering the police for something dumb. After about an hour, Megan's phone started dying, so we decided to switch spots. For some reason, neither of us really understood. We were so terrified of making any sort of noise that we made sure to walk on our tiptoes and take steps at the exact same time to minimize the amount of sound we made. At one point, Megan started smothering me with a pillow because I had an allergy attack and kept sneezing. With the both of us now situated, we tried to relax, still being kind of terrorized by the sounds of someone shuffling around outside the door and the occasional cough. At around five, we heard what sounded like a small animal fall into the grate that also acted as a window for the basement bedroom and begin running around. The rocks at the bottom were moving and bouncing off the window, and then it went silent. About 10 minutes later, it sounded like another animal had fallen in, and the sound started up again. This cycle continued for pretty much that entire hour. The entire time that all of this was happening, Megan and I were terrified. It was like that feeling you get right before your car gets rear-ended or right as you're about to go down a giant roller coaster hill. Just plain fear, anxiety, and the subtle feeling that something is just not right. It doesn't sound like much, but for some reason, Megan and I were just absolutely scared out of our minds. We both understood that we were not alone in that basement, and whatever was down there with us was actively trying to freak us out. We were saved at around seven, the sun started to rise and we heard my uncle get up to take the dogs out. Neither Megan nor I had slept at all and we suddenly felt exhausted as the adrenaline that had been fueling us the entire night seemed to die out. The sounds hadn't stopped, but they had significantly decreased as the hours passed. Now, hearing her dad up and about, we felt a little bit safer leaving the comfort of the bedroom. We quietly and quickly moved the mirror back to its space on the wall, and then, on the count of three, unlocked the door and ran to the stairs. We didn't stop to look around or turn off any of the lights, even though by that point the basement was fully illuminated with the sunlight and the lights that we had left on when vacating the living room. We booked it up the stairs and came to a screeching halt in the kitchen where her dad was making coffee. We immediately told him everything and begged him to check out the basement, still not fully convinced that it wasn't a normal person. He checked and sure enough, nothing had been tampered with and the entire basement was empty. Megan made some ramen for breakfast since we were starving and just wanted something comfortable. And after eating, she went upstairs to tell her mom. I stayed downstairs, eating and trying to come to terms with what I had just experienced. Her mom didn't believe her at first, 
But when I told the same story and Megan almost started crying from not being believed, she changed her mind. My aunt was resistant to the idea that her house, specifically the basement, was haunted. But then, later that year, she experienced it for herself. The main thing I remember from this whole ordeal was the fear. It was so raw and intense, and there was just this weird knowledge that we weren't alone down there, and that whatever it was, was not good. Megan and my other cousin theorized that it was Theodore, the name they had given the resident ghost that stays down there, but I don't think so. Nothing like that has happened to anyone else ever again, and it's just not what we know to be Theodore's style. I don't know. I don't know what was down there with us, or who. I don't know why they were there or what they wanted, really. But there was something with us that night, and it scared me in a way that I have never, ever felt since. Unexplained voices from the basement. Okay, so this is something straight out of a horror movie, and it happened to me. I never really believed in the whole paranormal thing, but this incident, let's just say it changed my mind. I was home alone one evening, just chilling and watching TV, when I heard it, this faint, indistinct mumbling coming from somewhere. I muted the TV, trying to figure out where it was coming from. It sounded like whispers, and it was coming from the basement. Now, I'm not usually the type to get scared easily, but something about this was just off. I mean, it's one thing to hear weird noises, but whispers? That's next level. I gathered my courage, grabbed a flashlight, and headed to the basement. The moment I opened the basement door, the temperature dropped. It was like I was walking into a fridge. The whispers got louder, and I could almost make out words, but not quite. It was like they were speaking a language I couldn't understand. I shone the flashlight around the basement, half expecting to see somebody hiding there. But it was empty. No sign of anyone or anything that could make those sounds. The weirdest part? The moment I stepped back upstairs, the whispers stopped. Just like that. I checked the whole house, even outside, thinking maybe it was some kids playing a prank. But there was nothing. No explanation at all. I've heard those whispers a few more times since then. Always coming from the basement. Always when I'm alone. I've tried recording it, but the sound never shows up on the recordings. It's like whatever it is, it doesn't want to be heard by anyone but me. So that's my story, and I still don't know what to make of it. Maybe it is just the house settling, or maybe it's something else. I do know one thing though, I'm not going down to that basement alone anymore. Back when I was still going to high school, I spent the night at my best friend's place. He lived in a basement. I woke up and went to the bathroom, and as soon as I got back to the room and laid back down, I closed my eyes. Then, I felt like someone or something was staring at me. I opened my eyes and saw a pale child staring me in the face. His dark eyes felt like they were staring into my soul. I yelled out for my friend, and as soon as he came into the room, the child disappeared. I told him what happened, and of course he didn't believe me. But now he says that apparently everybody who's ever slept in that room has seen him. His girlfriend, his brothers, and me. But he has never seen the boy. 
To this day, I can still remember what he looks like. This story happened a long time ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday, and so does my cousin. Our families were very close growing up. We were there often, usually just watching movies. We were young, and this was around the time that the killer clown thing was happening. So when we would watch movies, they would usually be horror. The Conjuring, Annabelle, etc. I was about 12 at the time. My cousin was 14, her brother was 12, and my brother was 8. We were in their basement one night while our parents and older siblings went out for the night. Babysitters weren't something we had. It was lock the doors, stay together, and don't answer the phone. My cousin's basement had a TV in the corner of the room, and on the same wall was a projector. My cousin, 12-year-old boy, and my brother had the hockey game playing on TV and Call of Duty on the projector while my cousin and I, she was a 14-year-old girl, were sitting shoulder to shoulder on the couch, back to the wall with our headphones in, watching videos on our phones. Our brothers decided they were hungry and turned on the lights as they went upstairs to find something to eat. My cousin and I sat for about five minutes before her brother's bedroom door in the basement slowly closed. When the door came to a full close, the lights in the room turned off, along with the projector and the TV. I paused the video that I was watching on YouTube and first assumed that it was a power outage as I didn't believe in ghosts. But when I checked my battery, I saw that my iPod was still charging. Before I could do anything, I heard the sound of my brother and cousin laughing, almost giggling behind my head as if they were right behind my ear but it sounded off. It didn't sound exactly like them. It creeped me out, and my head shot up and toward my cousin, who was already looking at me with her eyes wide. Like I said, we were backed up to a wall, so there's no way anybody could have been behind us. Neither of us missed a second to get up and run upstairs. The first thing we did when we got up there was to look at each other. I said, you heard it too? She agreed, explaining to me what she had heard, which was exactly what I had also heard. We walked toward the kitchen and saw her brother. We explained to him what had happened. He didn't believe us and told us that my brother had been on the third floor bathroom ever since they left and they didn't talk or laugh. This creeped out my cousin and I even more. And when he went downstairs, everything was turned back on and the bedroom door was open. We talk about that night every few years, and it still creeps us out to this day. I'm not sure if I'm haunted or something, but I do have a lot of ghost stories that started happening after that night. Kids that I babysit keep telling me that they see things around me, or similar things from that night will happen to me in my basement with or without other people there. Whenever I tell people about these events, they seem to have something happen to them afterwards, and stories come back to me. Usually the ones who joked about what happened or didn't believe in it had an encounter. I think something followed me out of her basement that day, but I don't know if it's evil, if that's possible. I still can't really explain it. It's just odd. This happened to me many years ago. I was maybe 10. I'm 23 now. My sister and I were over at her friend's house, which she had told us was haunted during prior visits. It was just us. Her mom was at work and her little sister was at daycare. We were down in the basement, which was half finished. 
It was furnished, but the walls had no siding yet. We were messing around down there, jumping on the couch, just doing kid stuff. We decided we were hungry, so we headed upstairs, shut the basement lights off, and took an immediate right at the top of the stairs into the kitchen. We were in there maybe a few minutes making sandwiches, when all of a sudden we heard the loudest, most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard come from the basement. It was absolutely terrifying. I don't know if three kids have ever gotten out of a house so fast. We sat on the curb across the street until her mom got home. I've had several encounters with what I presume to be the paranormal, but that was by far the most horrifying and memorable. It still gives me the creeps to talk about it, and to this day I'll sometimes text my sister to ask if she remembers it, just to make sure I'm not crazy. I have this problem since I've moved in to where I currently live. It's a rather basic problem. The lights in the basement go out at night. At first, I thought it was just the light bulb itself, so naturally, I changed it. Yet, whenever I wanted to grab something from the basement and it happened to be around 1 to 5 a.m., the light just wouldn't go on. I changed the bulb several times and it did nothing. The strangest thing is that I can literally have it turned on all evening, and it's fine. Then I watch it go dark at night. It annoyed me to the point where I recently called an electrician to check if everything was all right with the wiring. Maybe it's some sort of automatic switch that turns it off during the night, right? Long story short, I paid quite some money for him to check everything, and he found nothing. I can't blame him since everything works perfectly fine during the day. The next thing I did was set up different lights inside of the room, a light with a battery. At this point, I got a little freaked out since it turned off as well. I carried it back upstairs and after a minute or so, it worked perfectly fine again. I carried it back downstairs and after a few seconds, it went out. I'm not exactly on the edge because my house isn't really haunted. I don't have bad dreams, no poltergeist activity or anything. It's literally just this strange light situation. As you can probably tell, I'm quite the skeptic. But could this actually be something paranormal? Could it be something natural? Magnetic fields or something? I'm not experienced with these kinds of things. Maybe there are other things I could try. I just think it's really weird that the lights in the basement, all of them, go out at night. As an adult, I don't really believe in ghosts. As a younger person, I had a couple of experiences that were kind of tough to find a good explanation for. This was one, if not the first, of a few events that I consider to be major events. My childhood home, and where my mother still resides today, was the setting for a couple of these events. It is a house that she and my father built when I was around three or four years old, prior to their divorce three or four years later. It's a one-story, three-bedroom brick house with a basement. The basement has a garage door that opens up on one side of the house, a single door and a couple of windows on the rear of the house, and the rest is enclosed by a sloped earth berm. The basement is not a finished or heated space, and it has served numerous purposes throughout the years. It's been a small workshop for lawn machinery and motorcycles, a playroom area complete with a pool table, and, more than anything else, a storage area for miscellaneous junk accrued through the years. It has a longer, around 12-foot-high wooden staircase that has never been finished or enclosed, 
that opens up into the home's main hallway. When I was around 12 years old, I was home alone one afternoon after getting off the school bus. It was a typical spring day with nothing out of the ordinary going on. I was eating a snack and watching TV when I thought I heard a noise in the house. I muted the television, got up, and walked around, checking the entire house. I didn't find anything abnormal, nor did I hear any strange sounds. I sat back down and unmuted the television. After a few minutes passed, I thought I heard something again. Again, I repeated the process of muting the TV and walking around the house to check things. Again, there was nothing obvious. I once again resumed my activities and, once again, after a few moments, I heard something. This time, it sounded initially like the sound was coming from the hallway or the basement. I walked to the door that leads to the basement and stood there for a moment, listening. To my surprise and absolute terror, I heard the distinct and loud sound of two feet stomping up the wooden staircase toward the door. Reflexively, I hit the door with an open palm and shouted, Hey! I made sure both the knob lock and the chain lock on the door were fastened, and I darted out the front of the house. I took off up a dirt path, bound for my grandfather's house a couple hundred yards away. I found him quickly and informed him of what was going on. I was completely sure that there was someone in the basement and that he had to go back with me to search the house. We went back immediately and couldn't have been away more than seven or eight minutes of total time. We started upstairs and found nothing out of the ordinary. We opened the basement door and ventured down. There was absolutely nothing there. The doors were locked. The windows were locked and still had the screens in them. There weren't any loose pipes or anything that could make a hammering sound similar to the distinct sound of someone bounding up those wooden steps. I was uneasy the rest of the evening, and I never thought about that basement the same way after that. I don't know what it was that made the sound, but it wasn't anything natural or a living, breathing creature. I've been dating my boyfriend for about three years now. We live with his grandparents. Now, his grandma is really into paranormal and supernatural things, and I remember that she told me when my boyfriend and I first started dating that she saw her dead aunt in the bathroom. When she told me this, I'm not too sure if I believed her because I can be skeptical about paranormal things at times. Fast forward, and my boyfriend and I are staying in her finished basement. One night, I was up pretty late, playing around and doing my makeup in the bathroom while my boyfriend was asleep. I saw something that looked like smoke fill the air, and I had this extremely uneasy feeling come over me. I felt the need to get out of that bathroom immediately, so I did. I ran out of the bathroom and flung myself onto the bed next to my boyfriend. Right when I laid down, I felt little pieces of my hair start to move. We sleep with a fan on high speed, and I like to sleep with my blanket over my head, so naturally I thought it was the fan blowing my hair. I tucked it back under the blanket. This happened seconds later, and it weirded me out. I eventually began to fall asleep when I woke back up. This was around 4 a.m. I felt pressure against my legs as if someone was sitting down on the bed next to me, and I could feel the blanket moving on the back of my legs. Obviously, I freaked out and sat up, but I saw absolutely nothing. I ended up getting myself to fall back asleep, but when my boyfriend got up for work at about 6 a.m., the basement door that leads to the woods in his backyard was wide open. This is the weirdest house I've ever lived in, and that was my first experience there but there ended up being a lot more where that came from. Mm -hmm. 
Although my experience starts off like every haunting movie, I promise that this is exactly how it went down. My best friend flips houses and found this huge Victorian mansion that went into foreclosure. It was up for auction and he was the only bidder. He paid next to nothing for this house. His plan was to demolish and update as much as he could on his own. I was there almost every day to help in any way that I could. It got me out of my house, kept my mind off things, and taught me a thing or two about renovating a house. It was a win-win for both of us. Beside the whole place having a cold, abandoned feeling, the only place that my stomach turned was in a specific room in the basement. I felt like I could pinpoint the exact corner where the bad vibes were coming from, and I voiced this to my friend and his girlfriend many times. I could barely step foot in this room. It felt like an invisible barrier was in front of me. Once I went into the room, I felt sick, bothered, and sad. This has never happened to me before. One night, we were out on the front porch when a neighbor came over and started talking to us about the history of the house. He said that it was one of the first ones built in the town and was once a part of the Underground Railroad. At one time, it was a firehouse, and later, it was used as a funeral home. We thought it was pretty cool and went to Google to find out more. Unfortunately, all of the history stuff like that was only at the library, so our search stopped there. One day, I arrived at the house before my friend did. He told me to go inside and start getting things ready. Side note, at this point, the only working bathroom was in the basement, and I was the only one in the house. I started getting things ready on the main floor, but kept catching glimpses of things out of the corner of my eye. It happened enough times to thoroughly freak me out. Some time passed, and my friend still wasn't there, when my urge to pee became too great to ignore. I only had one inside option, in the bathroom, in the basement, next to the creepy room. I was about 25 at the time, but still, I was so afraid to go into that basement that I peed outside in broad daylight where numerous neighbors could have seen. I'm also a girl, so it was pretty clear what I was doing. That's how scared I was. After my friend's girlfriend had some creepy vibes, she decided to find a medium to come stay the night and do a full-blown Ghost Adventures lockdown. I'm super into creepy stuff, so I was excited to be a part of it and hear if they found anything interesting. They did not want to know anything about the house or any of the experiences that we had had before they did their investigation. The next day after the lockdown, we sat down with the medium and her team to discuss their findings. I kid you not that the medium says they found the spirit of a slave that had not crossed over. He was in the basement of the house when it was part of the Underground Railroad. The medium noted that he was afraid of people and saw him cowering in this one corner. It was the same room and the exact corner that had made me feel so uneasy and sick to my stomach. I visibly turned white and every hair on my body was sticking up. The medium noticed my reaction and I told her about the weird vibes and the stories that the neighbor told us. She told me that she could tell I was sensitive and in tune to other energies around us that other people can't see and feel. One time, about two or three years ago, I was out in the woods camping with my brother. We had just gotten there at about 4 p.m. to set up and everything like that. Once we had everything set up, we got a fire going. I told my brother that I was going to go get some firewood because we really only had enough to start the fire. It was about seven o'clock and then I suddenly got really cold, even though the weather wasn't cold at all. When I got this sudden rush of coldness, I felt a heavy feeling 
of just pure evil and hatred and despair. I immediately went back to my brother. He told me that it was fine and that there was probably just a strong thing of wind that made me cold, but I knew something was wrong. We sat around the fire and I just felt like someone or something was watching me. Once again, I started to feel that same feeling of pure evil. It started to get worse and worse, kind of like it was growing inside me, but I tried to brush it off and I just went to bed. At around 2.20 in the morning, I heard something that sounded like a scream and it woke me up. I looked around in the tent and got a flashlight. When I turned the light on, I noticed that my arm was bleeding and had been cut open by something in multiple spots. I woke my brother up in a panic and told him what had happened. He said that he didn't know what I was talking about and that my arm wasn't even cut, even though I was looking right at it and it was obviously cut open and bleeding. I was like, are you joking? He continued to say that nothing happened to me and kind of irritated said that I was pranking him. At around that time, I felt a huge amount of pain in my arm, and then I heard the scream again. But it didn't sound like how a human screams. It was more of a screech, as though there was some kind of animal or some creature in the distance that was in pain. I looked at my brother and asked if he had heard it, and he said, What do you mean? I didn't hear anything. Nothing happened. At that point, I was scared for my life. I mean, if it was an animal, he would have heard it too. I was just praying that nothing more would happen. After a few minutes, I heard the scream again. Every time that thing screamed, I would get that feeling again, and my arm would start to burn. Eventually, all of it stopped. After that, I wasn't able to sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, I told my brother that I just wanted to leave right away. When we got into the truck, I could have sworn that out of the corner of my eye, I saw something run through the woods. We got to the truck and I looked to the right while packing the stuff up and four of the trees had marks like they'd been clawed by something. The thing is, the marks were at least 12 feet up in the trees, maybe higher. At that point, I was tired and scared, so I just got in the truck and we left. To this day, I still haven't gone camping again, and I still wonder what that was. So something just happened in the basement and I thought I'd tell you about it. Here's a little house layout to help a bit. Our living room has two ways to enter, one from the kitchen and one from the front door. The staircase leads right down to the front door. The way to the living room from the front door has you pass a hallway that has closets and the door to the basement. So it's 1.39 in the morning and I'm done scrolling through social media and decide to sleep. However, I want to cuddle with my kitty while I rest. I have a kitty sleeping on the headboard, but she's so peaceful I don't want to interrupt her. So I decide to head down to the main floor to find one of my other two cats. Down the stairs, I see my fluffy Newfoundland dog sleeping by the front door as usual. I decide to take the way through the kitchen to grab a snack. Then I come into the living room and I see my other cat sleeping in their cat tree. They look so peaceful, I decide it would be rude if I let one sleep and took the other one to cuddle with. So I let them sleep and started my way back into my room through the hallway. As I come to the archway from the living room to that hallway, the basement door slams all the way open hitting a table that we have behind it. I'm scared out of my mind and immediately turn around to go the way through the kitchen. As I approach the front door, I pet my dog and I remember thinking, maybe I'll see a ghost down the hallway. I can take a peek. 
My biggest fear is ghosts and demons, so I have no idea why I did this. I don't even walk to the hallway. I just peek around the wall. The basement door is swaying back and forth gently. I get even more scared and run to the top of the stairs, into my room, shut the door, pull up Reddit, and basically now dreading the fact that I have to pee because I don't want to leave my room. I want to say that it's the air conditioning, but down that hall, there are no vents. The only vent is in the laundry room, which is past a weirdly long hallway, and it has a door. I have no idea what could have made that door do that. I like stories about the paranormal, but I've never personally experienced anything, and I tend to be pretty skeptical about them. However, there was a weird experience that I wanted to share and see what people thought about. Back in 2009, I was in college a couple of hours away from home. My grandparents, who I lived with through the last two years of high school, were away from home at their second property, where they were building their retirement home for the weekend, and I wanted to get off campus. So my friends, let's call them Jess and Nina, and I decided to go to the house for the weekend. My friend Jess claims to be sensitive. She has told me stories about things coming into her room when she was growing up, and I can tell she's genuine. But to my knowledge, science has yet to demonstrate the existence of any kind of life after death, so I remain skeptical. I could tell something was off as soon as we pulled up to the house. I'm grabbing my bag from the truck, and I look over to her to see her staring up at the house. I ask her if she's okay, and she just says one word, occupado, and then proceeds to grab her bag from the truck and we all head inside. Let me give you the layout. The house was built in the 80s and my grandparents bought the place in 99. The previous owner had died in the home, in his sleep, I think. It was a two-story brick home that backed up to a lake. It was quite a nice place to live, but there were also parts of the house that always used to creep me out for some reason. The front sitting room and dining room upstairs and the stairs to the basement where I lived in high school. But like I said, I never experienced anything. Anyway, my grandparents knew that we were coming down for the weekend, but they were going to be gone for a while so they shut off all the water in the house, except for to the downstairs bathroom. We all go inside, and a few hours later, Jess decides to go downstairs to use the bathroom. Nina and I stay upstairs watching a movie. She's gone for quite some time, and when she comes back upstairs, she asks us what we wanted while she was in the bathroom. Nina and I just look at each other, confused, we hadn't left the room and we hadn't called for her. We didn't know what she was talking about. She asks if either one of us had come downstairs and tried to turn the bathroom door handle while she was in there. We looked at her, incredulous, and tell her that we had not. She grows pale and my heart starts to race. I think someone is in my house. Nina and I grab knives from the kitchen and go room to room searching for an intruder. We find nothing. The house is quiet for the rest of the weekend. I still think about that sometimes. I don't know what it was. Maybe my friend was daydreaming and maybe she got into her own head. Maybe she was messing with us, although she swears up and down that she wasn't and she looked genuinely terrified. Maybe there was someone in the house, though I'm pretty sure we would have heard them opening a door also, there was a security system that beeped if any door or window were opened. I just don't know. What do you think? In September, 
My partner and I signed the lease on a dream apartment. I was ridiculously excited, and I kept telling everybody I knew all about it, to the point where I was probably pretty annoying. One day, a friend of mine came to visit me at work, and of course, I told her the news of our new place. She asked me where it was, and when I told her the location, she turned pale and seemed uncomfortable at best and flat out scared at worst. She asked to see a picture of the inside, and when I showed her, she let out a long sigh of relief, then proceeded to tell me one of the creepiest stories I have ever heard. It turns out that about five years ago, she had lived in the house directly next to mine with her sister and boyfriend. Starting almost immediately when they moved in, they began hearing noises out in the kitchen area at night when they were sleeping. And occasionally, they woke up to the cabinets or kitchen tools being opened or scattered around. Eventually, they started to hear what sounded like kids talking in low voices in the kitchen at night, occasional crying, and crashes that sounded far off but still somewhere in the house. Around this time, my friend and her sister started to fight a lot, and she said that they'd both been feeling extremely irritable about everything. Their house was broken into while they were all at work one night, but nothing was stolen except for some cheap costume jewelry. There was cash, valuable jewelry, and designer clothing in the house, but all of it was left untouched. Later in the same month, they received a visit from the cops, who said a neighbor had called about screaming and crying coming from the house and had reported that they had left their children alone when they went out. They didn't have kids. The cops were called a few other times and finally got a search warrant. Somehow, they ended up finding a trap door under the kitchen window area that was covered in a layer of leaves and dirt. They found out that it was the remains of a very old root cellar. I live in one of the oldest cities in America, and much of the structures are built on top of older structures. That's not the surprising part. One thing led to another in the search down there, and the police recovered some very old skeletal remains of two children. Nobody seemed to know if the skeletons or the root cellar were there first. During all of this, my friend and her sister broke their lease and moved out of there immediately, as they were terrified to be there any longer. I went through with my lease, and I live in the building next door to where all this happened. My apartment is an old adobe market that was converted into an apartment in the 70s, and it's been an absolute dream to live here. No scary vibes or noises at all. The couple who live in that house now seem pretty nice and keep to themselves. We all have high adobe privacy walls and coyote fences, and I feel tempted to see if they know about all of this. But I'm afraid it might make them uncomfortable if I approach them about it. In any case, that was the wildest story I've ever heard. Every night, I walk down the stairs to the basement and then into my gaming room to unwind with some video games. As I reach the bottom of the stairs, I turn on the light, but I keep it dimmed, just so I can make my way to my room. At about midnight, it's time to go to sleep, so I open the door of my gaming room to find the lights completely turned off. I deliberately keep the switch at halfway, and when I go to the staircase, they're always pulled all the way down. I've always thought that it was my wife who would come downstairs and shut them off. I politely asked her why she would shut the lights off, and she replied, I've never gone downstairs to shut the lights off, not even once. For context, I've seen shadowy images run by in the basement. I dismissed it as being fatigue. 
However, when my niece was just three years old, she said that there was a boy with red eyes on the staircase. We thought it was just her childhood imagination. Then when my son was two to three years old, he ran into my arms after staring at the staircase. I asked him what was wrong, and finally he said, they're spooky with red eyes. Could entities actually physically manipulate the light switch? I can't explain what's going on. My dad works for a contracting company in St. Louis, Missouri. The building's interior is exactly the same as it was in the 1960s, all except for the dust and deterioration. The actual date of construction is 1910. It's only a five-story tall building. It's nothing immensely big. It was previously used as a law firm, but when the firm left, they decided not to take anything with them. There were tons of law books, paintings, desks, etc. But the basement. Back in 1960, they started to renovate it, but never finished. So the basement is an extremely dilapidated 1910s, paint falling off, broken glass ridden, rusting freight elevator, deadly tetanus infested nail cesspit. But my dad and I went in there anyway. Keep this in mind. My dad coaches boxing as a hobby and he's huge, all muscle. He's fought all his life. And even he is scared of that basement. Every time we go down there, something is different. The first time I remember going down there, the plaster on the walls of a hallway had fallen. And I mean all of it. The whole hallway was stripped down to its bare structure. I assumed, of course, it was because of the renovation. But my dad said, what's all this shit? It wasn't here before. So we go down the hallway and yeah, in and of itself, it's nothing really special. But there was a metal chair in the middle of this dark hallway, and for whatever reason, it just freaked me out. My dad turned on the lights, and they worked for a second, but then they all busted. Some of them just fizzled out, probably because of how old they were. So down the hall, there was a boiler room. It contained this rubberized trench coat, rubberized to avoid stains, and a bowling ball bag. Inside the bowling ball bag was a cleaver with what I assume was a deer bone handle. After that, we left. A few weeks later, we came back down and all the plaster on the floor was gone. We went to the end of the hallway and the boiler room door was closed. Maybe we closed it, but I don't remember doing that at all. It doesn't seem like our priority would have been to close that door when we were getting out of there. By the way, nobody has the key to the building except my dad. He and I are the only ones to enter the building, ever. At the end, there was a T-shaped intersection. On the wall, there were three identical pictures of the same exact priest with a deadpan expression. His eyes were glazed over like he was possessed or couldn't see or something. We came back after a few months, near Christmas. We only made it down the steps and immediately left. There was a Christmas tree little lights blinking, and a Santa Claus doll with the most indescribably creepy grin I've ever seen in my life. Something was definitely going on in that basement.